Okay. The subcommittee will come to order. <coughs> this is a uh, joint uh, hearing between the subcommittee um, on energy and, and economy and the subcommittee on health. The chair will recognize himself for an opening statement. <coughs> Today's hearing will provide an opportunity for our two subcommittees to examine the issues related to the ongoing drinking water crisis and related public health effects in Flint, Michigan. Members of the committee already have a basic understanding of the situation that led to the high levels of lead discovered in the Flint drinking water system. The focus of today's hearing will be how we can best respond to help affected families in Flint and how we can best move forward with solutions to ensure this does not happen again. Our witnesses today will be able to provide key insights on what efforts both the federal and state governments are undertaking, and I look forward to their testimony. According to the Mayo Clinic, lead poisoning, quote, can severely affect mental and physical development, end quote, and can even be fatal at high levels. From a public health standpoint, we will want to better understand how the administration has coordinated with the state of Michigan to provide technical assistance to state and local health departments, including how they help with case management and interventions with children identified with elevated blood level lead levels. Addressing the long-term health implications of potential exposure of children to dangerously high levels of lead is no simple fix. Some steps have already been taken to attempt to address the serious public health issues in the community. Just last month, the administration announced an expansion of Head Start and Early Head Start in Flint, Michigan, with a one-time emergency influx of $3.6 million for these programs. Additionally, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, approved Michigan's application to establish a five-year Medicaid demonstration, Flint, Michigan, Section 1115 demonstration, in response to the public health emergency of lead exposure related to the Flint water system. The U.S. Department of Agriculture's Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, WIC, is allowing participants to use WIC vouchers for ready-to-feed infant formula, which does not need to be mixed with water. Participants can also swap powdered formula for ready-to-feed formula. WIC participants are being referred to the local health department for lead screenings and provided nutrition education on mitigating lead absorption through dietary changes. These steps should help expand services available to ensure access to needed medical, social, educational, and other services. We're eager to hear of other options that may be employed to alleviate the potential impacts lead can have on health. I look forward to our hearing today. Thank all of the witnesses on both panels for participating in this important hearing. Anyone, seek, anyone on, on our side seeking time? Not? We'll, I'll yield back and recognize the ranking member, Mr. Green, five minutes for opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, and thank all of you for being here for this important hearing. The drinking water crisis in Flint, Michigan is a national tragedy. It's a preventable man-made disaster that should have been intervened months before it caught the nation's attention. Most tragically are the estimated 8,000 children under the age of six who were exposed to unsafe levels of lead who may not need lifelong services to fully uh, live fully productive lives. Childhood lead poisoning is a tragedy impacting communities throughout our United States. The Centers for Disease Control estimates that approximately 500,000 American children under six have blood lead levels above five uh, micrograms, the level recommended for public health actions to be initiated. Children from low-income communities, communities of color, like those in Flint and communities I have the honor of representing in Houston, Harris County, Texas, are two to three times more likely to have elevated blood levels based on CDC data. The no child in America, regardless of background or income, should be a victim of lead poison. The city of Houston has been proactive on this issue. Houston's one of the six cities to be part of the CDC Child Lead Poisoning Prevention Program. 
with the ambitious goal of eliminating childhood lead poisoning in the city by 2020. In 2013 alone, over 24 children were screened for lead, and since 1996, nearly 3,000 homes have been remediated for lead paint. I support these efforts, but more must be done to ensure that every child is tested for lead and all older homes are lead paint free in Houston and across the nation. Unfortunately, the CDC program has drastically cut in recent years from 30 million in 2011 to 15 million last year. Health and Human Services working with Congress must ensure that this and similar other similar programs get resources they need to protect our children from lead exposure. The recent study conducted by the American Water Works Association estimates that there's 6.1 million lead service lines used nationwide serving 15 to 22 million Americans. These lead service lines are greater concentrated in Midwest and Northeast. Um, LSLs are found in every state. My home state of Texas is estimated to have 270,000 lead service lines still in use, eighth highest in the country. If we're going to eliminate lead out of our drinking water once and for all, our nation must commit to the comprehensive plan to replace lead lines, service lines. This will ne necessitate coordination between water utilities, city, states, and EPA with a sizable commitment of resources from the federal government to support local communities and low-income households uh, replacing their lead lines. And I'm proud to join my colleague, Representative Paul Tonko, as an original co-sponsor of the Aqua Act, which would reauthorize Safe uh, Drinking Water Act for the first time in 13 years and give states greater resources to update our nation's aging drinking water infrastructure by increasing funding for the state revolving fund. The Safe, water, the Safe Drinking Water Act was passed by Congress four decades ago to ensure drinking, uh, public drinking water supplies throughout the nation. It's clear today that uh, um, our Safe Drinking Water Act failed to protect the people of Flint and other communities around the country. As the commu Committee of Jurisdiction, uh, we need to know why. Much of the responsibility for the failure to appear point to the lead and copper rule. LCR has not seen major revisions in 20 years. I'm very interested in hearing what EPA has done to modernize the lead copper rule and what revisions the public health and water utility experts reports today uh, believe are necessary to ensure that our public water systems are lead free. I hope that today's hearing will bring frank and fruitful discussion on these critical issues in public health and that we find common ground moving forward to ensure that this terrible tragedy never hits another Amer great American city. Mr. Chairman, I hope our committee will um, use our jurisdiction to further us and uh, do our best to do. And I'd be glad to yield my, the remainder of my time to my colleague from North Carolina, Congressman Butterfield. Thank you, Mr. Green, and I'll talk fair. On March 4th, members of the Congressional Black Caucus, the Congressional Progressive Caucus, and members of the House Democratic Leadership traveled to Flint to see the ongoing environmental disaster. I can only describe the frustration and harm to the residents of Flint as gut-wrenching. People have lost hope in their government that have failed them at many levels, none more so than at the state level under the management of Governor Snyder. I'm disappointed that the Governor is not here today to answer for his role and that of his administration in failing to protect the well-being of nearly 100,000 Flint residents. I understand this is a hearing on lessons learned from Flint, but this is not the first time people have been poisoned by their water, and it will not be the last until we make real investments to fix the root of the problem. I represent a poor district in North Carolina, uh, which unfortunately is no stranger to lead poisoned water over the, over the last decade. Cities of Durham, Greenville, and rural areas in Wayne County have all had unsafe drinking water. Levels of contamination in Durham exceeded 800 parts per billion. This is unacceptable, whether it's in Durham, Greenville, Wayne County, or in Flint, Michigan. Too often, Mr. Chairman, these problems occur in vulnerable communities, and our response is too little too late. Access to clean water should not be a luxury. It should be a guarantee. The tragedy in Flint has highlighted one of the key environmental justice issues of this generation, and it's time to fix this inequity now. I thank the witnesses for coming today. I yield back. Chair, <coughs> Chair, thanks the uh, gentleman, and now recognize the chair of the full committee, Mr. Upton, five minutes for opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, the tragic situation in Flint has captured the attention of the nation, that is for sure, and the events that unfolded are simply unacceptable. And sadly, there were missteps at all levels of government. What happened to Flint and its residents, especially the kids? Being poisoned in their own home absolutely breaks your heart. And long after the media leaves Flint and the dust settles, families, real Michigan families, will be grappling with this tragedy for decades, most likely lifetimes. 
That's why today's hearing is going to take a look forward. I've said before, and I'm going to say it again, that I'm not interested in finger pointing. There has been much of that done already. The focus needs to be on the folks who are impacted, especially the kids, and what we can do to ensure that this does not happen again anywhere. We're interested today in examining the underlying causes, various public health implications, and potential solutions moving forward. And while we can't rewind the clock to prevent the colossal failure of public trust, actions taken by both the state of Michigan and the federal government are important steps in the right direction. The administration and state have coordinated to disseminate public health education, provide case management and interventions for kids with elevated blood levels, and have worked to identify vulnerable populations in Flint who may need further targeted outreach. The federal government should work with the state to ensure that proper testing and monitoring is indeed taking place. We know that early education is a critical factor in combating the effects of lead exposure. In February, HHS awarded grants of $250,000 to two health centers in Flint. These funds are being used to hire additional personnel, provide more testing, treatment, outreach, and education on the lead exposures. HHS has also announced an expansion of Head Start, an early Head Start in Flint, and a one-time emergency influx of $3.6 million for these programs. Thank you. In March, CMS also approved Michigan's application to establish a five-year Medicaid demonstration project in response to the public health emergency. Michigan will expand coverage for kids up to age 21 and for pregnant women with incomes up to and including 400 percent of the f federal poverty level who were served by the Flint water system from April of 2014 through a state-specified date. Additionally, Michigan has indicated that it will implement a state program to make available unsubsidized coverage for higher income populations in Flint. Here in the House, we also took action. We passed H.R. 4470, the Safe Drinking Water Act Improved Compliance Act, by a vote of 416 to 2. This bipartisan solution, championed by Flint Congressman Dan Kildee and co-sponsored by the entire Michigan delegation, ensures that the public is notified of excessive lead levels in the drinking water and also clarifies and improves the process of federal, state, and city officials communicating promptly with each other, as they should. Communities across the country, mine included, and would note this is this week's, my, my local paper uh, earlier this week, the Herald Palladium, uh, with the headline, U.S. Water Systems Repeatedly Exceed Federal Standards for Lead. All communities are worried about water infrastructure issues. And our bipartisan bill that passed again in the House specifically calls on EPA to help communities develop a strategic plan for dealing with emergencies like this before they happen. Today we expect to learn more from EPA about its plans with the lead and copper rule under the Safe Wa Drinking Water Act. We're also going to learn from Michigan's Keith Cray and Nick Lyons on what steps the state and community are taking to get Flint water back up to national standards. In the second panel, we're going to hear from an association of water utilities and association of state drinking water regulators, what lessons that they have learned and what they are doing to apply those lessons. We're also going to hear from Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha, Program Director, Pediatric Residency at the Hurley Children's Hospital. Dr. Mona, as she is called, provides an important perspective on children's health, and I'm pleased that she is with us uh, so that we can continue to work together. It's my hope that this hearing is going to serve as a valuable opportunity to hear more about this important work, ideas for further steps that can be taken by the federal government and the state of Michigan to help the people of Flint, and how Congress can ensure with confidence that this does not happen again. We cannot and we will not forget those in Flint who have been impacted by this tragedy no amount of regrets or words can actually fix what's broken. We need concrete action. I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. And now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Pallone, five minutes for opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing today. This committee's jurisdiction over public health and the environment makes it uniquely positioned to address the future in Flint, and I'm glad we're beginning that process today. 
I remain extremely concerned about the water and health crisis. Flint has been without safe drinking water for far too long. It's important that we all recognize that all levels of government will need to invest untold millions, if not billions, to mitigate the damage to Flint residents caused by this man-made disaster. This hearing is an opportunity to address how we move forward and ensure that anyone impacted has access to support and assistance as long as necessary. We must decide what is needed to fix Flint's infrastructure and address the potential impacts lead contamination may have on Flint's children, which will take years. The people in Flint need a fully functional drinking water system that delivers safe water to their homes. We need to take a hard look at whether the reestablishment of corrosion control is working to prevent further leaching from lead service lines, and we need to know more about what is required to have those pipes removed and replaced. There are also significant health needs that must be addressed. Flint's residents, especially the children, will require a suite of services, including ongoing testing and monitoring for lead exposure. They will also likely need a range of behavioral health, educational, and social services going forward. Thankfully, our Medicaid program is structured just for emergencies like this one, but moving forward, our task will be to ensure that every affected child in Flint is not only enrolled, but also receiving the services they need through the Michigan's Medicaid program. Today is, an also, is also an opportunity to begin to address the problems beyond Flint. For instance, in New Jersey, the Newark school system has ordered that water be turned off at 30 schools due to the presence of lead. Flint reminds us that if we fail to properly invest in health and safety, the consequences can be devastating. And in many instances, we will need to invest even more resources in response if we wait. We must act now to ensure Americans throughout the country do not suffer from these same problems. Now, Congress banned the use of lead in new pipes 30 years ago, but between 3.3 and 10 million older pipes remain in use throughout the country today. Families living in homes connected to these pipes all across the country are potentially at risk from lead leaching from these aging pipelines into their plumbing. Children are most affected by these aging pipelines and the associated negative health effects linked to lead exposure. The CDC estimates that half a million U.S. children ages 1 to 5 have blood lead levels that exceed the agency's guidelines of 5 micrograms per deciliter. As deeply concerning as these statistics are, they understate the problem. The current scientific consensus holds that no amount of lead in the blood is safe for children. It is long past time for a serious conversation in this country about the dangerous lack of federal investment in our drinking water infrastructure and in our public health system. The Safe Drinking Water Act needs to be strengthened. EPA needs more authority to set health protective standards for all drinking water contaminants, and we need to invest in our water systems to ensure safe drinking water. We also must ensure the necessary resources for providing health care to monitor and address lead poisoning, as well as preventing lead poisoning in the first place. So I want to thank all the members of both subcommittees here today for your continued attention on this issue. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about how we can all work together to ensure a strong future for the residents of Flint. Uh, I'd like to yield, I know I have a minute and a half, half the time to Ms. Matsui and Ms. Capps. We'll start, I guess, with Ms. Matsui. Thank you, Mr. Pallone. First and foremost, we must do everything we can to support the women, children, and families in Flint affected by this public health crisis. Contaminated water and lead poisoning were the end result of a system that failed the people of Flint. But Flint is far from the only community at risk. Today, we need to ask the hard questions and offer real solutions so that the suffering in Flint is not repeated in cities and towns across the nation. A first step is increasing funding for our water infrastructure. This infrastructure must be resilient and sustainable because it's also our first line of defense. We also need to ensure that our public health infrastructure is robust so we can both prevent and respond to crises like those in Flint. This means investments in public health, surveillance, prevention and screening, and treatment. I hope today we can learn about ways that can support our programs in our local health departments, as well as Medicaid programs, to prevent and respond to public health crises. Thank you, and I yield to Ms. Capps. I yield to Ms. Capps. For yielding, uh, you know, all people have the right to safe, reliable drinking water, no matter where you live. This crisis shines the spotlight on our country's insufficient water system and potential devastation that can result from not investing in our nation's most important infrastructure. The central need for safe access to drinking water is exactly why Representative Tonko and I and several others introduced the Assistance, Quality, and Affordability Act a little over a month ago. 
The bill marks a much needed start to address the issues facing our crumbling drinking water infrastructure. And I'm happy that several components from my water infrastructure resiliency and sustainability act are among the many pro important provisions included to help ensure that our water is available and safe. But while we could spend our time talking about those, the fact is that lack of access to clean water threatens our family's health and our well-being. It compromises our very way of life. So today's hearing is an important first step in what I hope will be a broader conversation on this imminent threat to our public health. It cannot wait. We must act now, and I yield back to my colleague. Chair, thanks, gentlelady. And now I recognize the ranking member of the uh, Environment and Economy Subcommittee, Mr. Tonko, five minutes for opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today for what I believe is a long overdue hearing. I look forward to hearing what is being done by all levels of government in response to this tragic and unnecessary crisis. By now, the details and timeline of events that led to this situation in Flint have been well established, but there are still many questions <laughs> to ask and, and many lessons left to learn. There is no safe level of lead in drinking water, yet it exists throughout our water systems in pipes, solder, and fixtures. The consequences of lead exposure for the people of Flint will be long-term and will require government assistance in education, public health, and mental health services for decades to come. It will affect the city's economy, and this event has lost its residents' trust in government, so be it for austerity approaches. We know the root causes of this catastrophe. I do not want to litigate the details that led to this tragedy, but I do believe it is a clear case of environmental injustice caused by public officials that cared more about saving dollars than about serving the health and welfare of the people for whom they speak. There is no question there were failures and failures of government. There were delays in acknowledging and in fixing serious problems. The evidence and concerns of legitimate and ex experts and the public were dismissed. Some causes were also structural. Flint's population decline in the past five decades has put tremendous stress on the city, on its water system, and on its residents. All of these issues are underlined by unaffordable water rates and aging infrastructure, which are sadly all too common in our country. Flint should open people's eyes, especially those in public service, that we cannot take safe drinking water for granted. Water supports every life, and water supports every job. And so, therefore, our drinking water systems cannot and should not be ignored. Our systems require investments. That's right, investments to upgrade, maintain, and replace basic physical infrastructure to ensure public health. Such investments are basic and cannot be denied for the sake of austerity. At the end of the day, someone will pay for our nationwide neglect of drinking water systems. And we have seen that paying later after a crisis is more expensive than investing now. In fact, my en engineering community, of which I'm part, tells me that we pay 10 times more when we wait for the break in a line to occur than to have done the preventative therapy. We will hear about the steps that must be taken moving forward, clarifying and strengthening the lead and copper rule, the risk of partial lead line replacement, issues around corrosion control, and improving our testing procedures. Many of these issues have been discussed by the Flint Water Advisory Task Force's report and the National Drinking Water Advisory Council Lead and Copper Rule Working Group report. These are important issues, but I want to be clear that these issues do not end at Flint's city limits. We have been severely underinvesting in our drinking water infrastructure for decades, and now we are seeing the dangerous and costly consequences. Why are we surprised? Removing lead in drinking water should be a national priority with a national discussion, and it must be done in a comprehensive and planned way. Corrosion control treatment will be part of the solution, but it is not a final answer. USA Today has reported that nearly 2,000 water systems across all of our 50 states have exceeded the EPA's lead action level within the past four years. That is strictly unacceptable. There are millions of lead pipes across this country, and given our track record for replacement, many lead pipes will remain for decades without a more proactive replacement plan. We know what we must do. Do we have the courage to go forward? We must improve lead testing, monitoring, and public notice to act on risks quickly. 
we need a focus on protecting vulnerable populations we need to address a lead exposure in schools and assist low income hono homeowners with lead lined replacement and we need a sustained and robust commitment to upgrade our water systems and remove those lead components the current federal commitment is simply not good enough we can't even say we lead by example we must step up to help states and local communities finance these projects a majority of the democrats on this committee have co sponsored the aqua act which will would reauthorize the drinking water srf at recovery act levels and beyond it also makes some much needed updates to the safe drinking water act including support for disadvantaged communities and additional emphases on the sustainability and affordability of our water systems we want to be partners in this effort but unless we get serious about addressing these bigger issues of deteriorating infrastructure and unaffordable drinking water it is only a matter of time before we are demanding another hearing on another preventable tragedy so i hope we can count on all members of this committee to make sure that the people of flint and in particular the children of flint get the assistance they need and that they deserve and i hope that we will do what is necessary and expand the federal commitment to ensure other communities get the resources that they need to prevent these future tragedies with that mr chair i yield back let's do the right thing chair thanks gentlemen <coughs> now rec recognize the chair of the environment and economy subcommittee mr shankless five minutes for opening statement thank you mr chairman uh, for recognizing me and yielding me this time at one level i'm glad to see we're looking into the tragedy in flint Michigan, and on another, I'm saddened and disappointed that e it even happened in the first place. The drinking water crisis that the residents of Flint, Michigan have had to endure has been called a tragedy so much that the word loses its meaning. I know there have been concerted efforts to assign blame for these problems, and other congressional committees have spent trying to look into who caused this or who didn't do enough to stop it. I have decided that there are very few white hats in this picture. Flint was let down by its federal and state government and its local officials, and the residents there are right to be skeptical. We need to look into what is being done to make the situation better, delve into what the schedule looks like to restore good drinking water to folks, and what the long-term plan is to take care of the health and the infrastructure of Flint. Ultimately, we need to ensure co coordination, openness, and cooperation between government, water utilities, and the public fuel so we can feel confidence that the work is being done. As part of this examination, we, sh we should appreciate what changes the Environmental Protection Agency is considering as part of its long-term revisions to the lead and copper rule. I recognize EPA has been getting input from the National Drinking Water Advisory Council and others but we should examine what the impact of some of those decisions might have on communities. We all want to protect public health, but there are a finite amount of resources, federal, state, local, and private, that can be brought to bear to address all issues. We need to prioritize the public health benefits we're addressing and getting. We want appropriate attention placed on this issue, but not at the expense of addressing other pressing public issues. I want to thank all of our witnesses for joining us today to give us their perspective. I want to welcome back Mr. Estes Marguiese, who testified on lead service line six years ago before this committee. Again, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time you have yielded to me, and I yield back the balance of my time. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. That concludes the opening statements. As usual, all members' written opening statements will be made a part of the record. We'll now proceed to our first panel, and uh, I apologize for the technical difficulties. I urge members as they walk down the center aisle not to bump the wires. It will result in all that cracking you're hearing. And the lights on the table do not work. So at four minutes, I will give you a couple of taps so you know you have one minute left. At five minutes, I'll do three taps for... Uh, <laughs> for you to be able to, to wrap up. And I'll introduce the first panel in the order of their presentations. Your written statements will be made a part of the record, but you'll each be given five minutes to summarize. And in the order of their presentations, we have Joel Ove, Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Office of Water U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, 
and then Dr. Nicole Laurie, Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, Mr. Nick Lyon, Director, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. And Keith Cray, uh, Director, Michigan Department of Environmental Quality. Thank you for coming. We appreciate you coming today. And as I said, you'll each be given five minutes to summarize your testimony. And at this point, the chair recognizes Mr. Nove, five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Pitts, and good morning to you and to Chairman Upton, to Chairman Shimkus, Ranking Member Green, Ranking Member Tonko, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about EPA's response to the drinking water crisis in Flint, Michigan. Under the Safe Drinking Water Act, Congress directed EPA to set national standards to protect public health, but assign primary responsibility to the states to implement these regulations. EPA maintains federal oversight of the state's drinking water programs. That system, while imperfect, has achieved major improvements in drinking water safety nationwide. The situation in Flint, however, underscores the need for urgent and sustained action by federal, state, tribal, and local governments and drinking water si system owners and operators na nationwide to address risks from lead in drinking water and to ensure that nothing like this ever happens again. As part of the coordinated federal effort led by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, EPA is working closely with the state of Michigan and the city of Flint to address the crisis in Flint. Since October 2015, EPA's Flint Safe Drinking Water Task Force, composed of agency experts in the areas of corrosion control and others, has provided technical assistance to the city and to MDEQ on steps needed to re-optimize corrosion control and ensure proper lead testing. On January 21st, EPA issued an emergency order under Section 1431 of the Safe Drinking Water Act, directing the state of Michigan, MDEQ, and the city of Flint to take actions necessary to ensure that corrosion control is re-optimized and that the city establishes the capacity to operate its drinking water system in compliance with the requirements of the law. EPA is an integral part of the federal response effort and has established a significant presence on the ground, which includes response personnel, scientists, water quality experts, community involvement coordinators, and support staff. In addition to providing ongoing technical assistance through the EPA Flint Task Force, EPA is conducting a multi-pronged effort to collect and analyze drinking water samples taken from around the city to help ensure transparency and accountability in assessing the status of Flint's system. Sampling results will continue to be shared with individual homeowners and are publicly available on EPA's website. EPA has also taken several concrete steps to address systemic issues raised during this crisis. EPA's Administrator McCarthy has directed a review of MDEQ's implementation of the Safe Drinking Water Act, has called on EPA's Inspector General to evaluate EPA's response to the Flint crisis, and has issued an agency-wide elevation memo encouraging staff and managers to raise issues of public health concern and to assure appropriate and prompt action to address such concerns. In addition, EPA is working with states that have primacy in implementing the Safe Drinking Water Act to strengthen implementation of the current lead and copper rule, which covers approximately 68,000 public water systems nationwide. EPA recently sent letters to the governors and drinking water regulatory agency heads of every primacy state in the country, asking them to work with EPA to strengthen implementation of the rule. That includes a series of specific actions to enhance transparency, accountability, and communication of timely information to the public. In addition, EPA has been actively working on revisions to improve the lead and copper rule. In December 2015, we received extensive recommendations on potential revisions from our National Drinking Water Advisory Council, composed of members of the general public, state and local agencies, and private groups, as well as from other concerned stakeholders. We're carefully evaluating this input and the national experience in implementing the current rule, including the events in Flint, to develop proposed improvements. EPA expects to propose revisions to the rule in 2017 and will welcome robust engagement and comments from the public and other in interested parties. Finally, the situation in Flint highlights the need for broader national action to address our drinking water infrastructure. In many areas of our country, that infrastructure is aging and severely underfunded, particularly in low-income communities 
which may have the most difficulty in securing traditional funding through rate incre increases or municipal bonds. As EPA continues to work to strengthen public health protections through regulatory policy and implementation, we also need a serious national conversation about how to advance the investments and technologies necessary to continue the delivery of safe drinking water to all Americans. I thank you for the opportunity to testif testify and welcome your questions. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize Dr. Lori, five minutes for opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Pitts, uh, Chairman Shimkus, um, Ranking Members uh, Green, Tonko, and Falone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Upton, and distinguished members of the committee. Appreciate the opportunity to testify about the water situation in Flint and the federal government's response. I'm Dr. Nicole Lurie, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response at the Department of Human Health and Human Services. I'm also the lead federal official for the response. And in that role, my job is to coordinate and bring the entire federal family together to deliver resources to help the people of Flint. When I was first asked to take on this role, I made the decision to base the federal response in Flint, not in Washington or in Lansing. I established a unified coordination group there to bring federal, state, and local partners together to assess the situation and align resources to support the community. Since then, I've been in Flint almost every week, meeting with community leaders, government officials, and most importantly, residents in Flint to ensure we were doing everything possible. We've had up to 110 people working on the ground at any one time, including staff from EPA, FEMA, USDA, HUD, HHS, and the Department of Education, as well as hundreds of others working remotely. We've had four major goals, providing safe water, supporting efforts to restore the water system, and mitigating the health effects of lead exposure. I'm pleased to report we have made real progress. FEMA's provided millions of liters of bottled water and tens of thousands of filters and cartridges to residents. Numerous partnerships have successfully delivered these commodities door to door and through points of distribution, and I'm confident that Flint residents have access to clean water for now. As you've heard, EPA is focused on helping the community restore their water system. Our major focus has been on understanding the extent of the lead exposure and doing everything we can to mitigate those effects. My first observation on arriving in Flint was that the community was scared, angry, and traumatized. In response, we immediately deployed teams from the U.S. Public Health Service to provide psychological first aid and to train others in those techniques. Behavioral health remains one of my priorities and is one shared by the community. In order to fully assess the potential impact of exposure, CDC advised that all children should have the opportunity to be lead tested or retested. There have been many, many testing events across the city, and what I can tell you is that fewer than 2% of children have high blood levels now. But we all know that all children in Flint were exposed to lead at the height of the crisis, and CDC is completing an independent analysis going back before the water switch to the Flint River to further inform our mitigation strategies. Another focus has been to ensure that all children with elevated lead levels receive timely follow-up from a nurse case manager so that we can link these kids to important services through their medical homes. CDC has provided extra personnel to support the state and county in achieving this goal. It will also be critical to follow kids over time. We're in the process of planning a long-term voluntary registry in collaboration with state, local, and academic partners. And this will be critical to the long-term monitoring and follow-up of kids with lead effects. Beginning early in the response, I began to hear from the community about concerns with rat. <laughs> I asked CDC and EPA to support the state in a comprehensive evaluation to see whether there might be additional substances in the water that could be causing them, and this investigation is underway. We know that a suite of interventions focused on early brain development can help kids overcome many of the harmful effects of lead exposure, and these include access to health care, developmental and behavioral assessments, early childhood education, and good nutrition. As you heard from Mr. Upton, HHS has approved a historic Medicaid expansion covering children through age 21 and up to 400 percent of the federal poverty limit, or approximately 15,000 additional children and pregnant women in the Flint area. We hope the state can move forward with this important enhancement as soon as possible. HHS has also provided an additional $3.6 million in one-time emergency funding to Flint's existing Head Start programs and made additional funding available to two community health centers to expand access, case management, and behavioral health services. And the Department of Agriculture is helping the state increase community access to foods that help combat the effects of lead in this community 
which still lacks a full service grocery store. Additionally, this summer USDA will extend nutrition benefits to an additional 15,000 students. In closing, this has truly been a whole community, whole of government response. Our progress in Flint has been made possible by strong partnership and coordination between federal, state, and local partners. Yet there's still work to be done to assure the best outcomes for Flint families. The federal government will continue to support Flint's recovery with the goal of helping its children and families lead happy, healthy, and productive lives. Thank you. Chair, thanks to the gentlelady. And now, Mr. Lyon, you're recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman Pitts and Simkus, Ranking Members Conco and Green, and members of the subcommittees for inviting me to this joint subcommittee hearing to discuss these important issues. I'd like to also thank Congressman Kilday and Upton for being here today. My priority as director for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services is to ensure a healthy, safe, and stable environment for all of Michigan's families. I know that the people of Flint are hurt. I know that they're upset. And I recognize that there is anger and mistrust, rightfully so. Despite the efforts of many dedicated and well-qualified people, both within my department and locally, the citizens deserve better. We have initiated an internal review in addition to the joint investigation being completed by the Office of Auditor General and Office of Inspector General. We will address whatever shortcomings are identified by these reviews within my department and will properly address issues and factors that affected our response. We know that we could have done better. My heart goes out to the families impacted and that's why I'm here today to talk about what Governor Snyder's administration, in particular my department, is doing to provide relief to the people of Flint and ensure that the necessary services are provided in the future. We are now looking forward at what we can do to improve the health and quality of not only Flint, but for all people in Michigan. We've already taken steps to restructure areas within our department to better align programs with surveillance and to ensure local health issues, such as the ones we are discussing today, are quickly elevated for immediate follow-up. For example, we've increased case management for all children with elevated blood lead levels in Flint to ensure their health is being immediately being addressed. We've funded additional nurse case managers in the Genesee County Health Department to work with families and we are aggressively working to increase services in the community. We know that outreach and continuity of care is important. And as part of our nurse case management efforts in Flint, we are now regularly testing water as a potential source of lead during follow-up with families, in addition to considering paint, soil, and dust exposures in the home. We're also working closely with our partners in Medicaid, our Medicaid health plan, to increase the number of children in Flint tested. While lead testing is required for all children enrolled in Medicaid, this is an area we continue to improve upon with our recent rebid in Michigan's Medicaid health plan, emphasizing the need. We're also working closely with our health care providers to ensure that all children are screened appropriately. In addition, the Flint Water Advisory Task Force has issued a comprehensive set of recommendations that we are actively reviewing for implementation. For instance, we know that good nutrition works to prevent the absorption of lead into the body. To increase access to sources of nutritious foods in Flint, we're working closely with the Food Bank of Eastern Michigan to arrange mobile, mobile food bank deliveries in 23 sites across the city. We're assisting the Michigan Department of Education in the coordination and placement of nine new nurses in the Flint community, and we're also adding additional schools to our existing program for child and adolescent health centers. We're developing, developing and coordinating long-term educational and behavioral screening tools, services, and supports for the children of Flint. We're working with the Genesee Health System and the Flint Community Resilience Group to develop and implement mental health first aid to assist the community in their recovery. And most recently, we are working to finalize a contract with the Genesee County Community Action Resources Department to replace water heaters for residents who water, whose water heaters may have been damaged. Throughout this emergency, we have greatly appreciated the support of our federal partners. Our department has six federal centers for disease control and prevention personnel embedded within our programs who continue to work closely with the Genesee County Health Department and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services as part of our efforts. Through those resources that we have available to us, we have worked closely with our partners in the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry to create and release a Legionella toolkit for healthcare facilities and large buildings to prevent the growth of Legionella in water systems. Ultimately, our hope is to help other communities in Michigan and across the country learn, as we have, how to prepare for and even prevent lead exposure and Legionella outbreaks as the one that occurred in Flint. We also appreciate the assistance of our partners at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services who have approved our application to extend Medicaid benefits to pregnant women and children up to the age of 21, up to 400% of the federal poverty level who were served by the Flint Water System. This waiver will ensure access to primary care and provide targeted case management services 
to coordinate all physical and behavioral health related services for children potentially exposed to lead. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration is providing technical assistance in many areas. The United States Department of Agriculture has approved our request to utilize our WIC program resources to test children for lead and enhance our nutritional education efforts. In implementing Governor Snyder's action plan, we are working with Dr. Hannah Atisha and Professor Mark Edwards through the Flint Water Interagency Coordinating Committee. I want to thank Dr. Mona Hannah Atisha, who will be testifying on the next panel, for bringing this issue to light and for continuing every day to help the families and children of Flint. She's an invaluable partner as we deliver on our commitment to provide the necessary health care services to these families. On behalf of the Snyder administration, I want to assure you that we stand committed to fixing this problem for the people of Flint and to ensure this does not happen again in Michigan or anywhere else. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I look <coughs> forward to answering your questions. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize Mr. Cray, five minutes for his opening statement. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to appear before this committee today. I'm Keith Cray, and on January 4, 2016, I was appointed to be the Interim Director of the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality. When I testified before the House Committee on Oversight and Gover Government Reform on February 3, 2016, my testimony described how all levels of government did not work together to protect the people of Flint, resulting in a water emergency. Since that time, government at all levels has begun working cooperatively to help the people of Flint. I look forward to discussing the progress made to provide resources and results for the people of Flint as well as some of the lessons learned. One of my first objectives was to implement changes in the culture of the department. We refocused our primary mission, mission to protecting the environment and public health. In reviewing the water source switch to the Flint River, we took a technical approach to compliance with the fed, federal lead and copper rule without adequately addressing public concern. One of the first lessons learned is that infra infrastructure changes are complex, especially in aging systems, and regulatory agencies need to engage with the experts in the public in a more meaningful way. Much of the progress to date has been achieved through the Flint Water Interagency Coordinating Committee. The coordinating committee is comprised of city, county, and state officials, private entities, and outside experts such as Dr. Mark Edwards and Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha. The objective of the coordinating committee is to connect all available resources to assist the people of Flint and mitigate the impact of lead exposure to the committee. Just Last Friday, the, the coordinating committee heard presentations on the current status of the Flint water system. The data indicates that the water quality is improving and that protective coating on the pipes is being restored. However, it is still unstable. The information sharing that has occurred as a result of the coordinating committee demonstrates a second lesson. In order to rebuild trust, government at all levels needs to share information in order for there to be effective discussions with experts and citizens. The Safe Drinking Water Act Improved Compliance Awareness Act passed in February by the House is a good first step. The, the state of Michigan has appropriated over $68 million to address the water issues in Flint with another $165 million pending. $30 million has been appropriated for the city of Flint to credit residents for water use for drinking, cooking, and bathing from April 2014 through April 2016. The state is paying for the reconnections to the Great Lakes Water Authority to supply finished, treated drinking water to Flint. Eighteen million has been set aside to provide long-term follow-up care to children. The department is paying for water sampling and testing, residential plumbing assessments, and reliability studies. We have established a Sentinel water testing program through which over 600 residents are sampling their water every two weeks. The results from the past four rounds of sampling show that over 92% of the households have results at or below 15 parts per billion of lead, but again, it shows instability. The department also supported a pilot service line replacement program in Flint. And additionally, the state has provided $2 million to the city of Flint for Mayor Weaver's Fast Start program to remove lead service lines with an additional $25 million in a pending supplemental appropriation. Moving forward, the department is committed to supporting the City of Flint's efforts to identify and prioritize replacement on, of unsafe service lines and other infrastructure to ensure the integrity of the drinking water system. The third lesson is simply replacing lead pipes alone will not solve this problem. Many of the high lead levels come from internal fixtures that either have lead components, lead solder, or have lead particles trapped in faucet aerators. 
A comprehensive lead education campaign must continue past the immediate emergency. We are working with EPA and outside experts to develop guidelines that will prohibit partial line replacement and establish replacement priority. Furthermore, a long-term strategy needs to be implemented that upgrades and maintains an appropriately sized water infrastructure for Flint. The fourth lesson is states should treat the federal rule as a floor, not a ceiling. Michigan is proposing to establish a comprehensive Michigan lead and copper rule to ensure necessary public health protections that exceed the existing federal rule. When it comes to protecting public health, states cannot wait for EPA's issuance of an updated rule. States must be willing to go above and beyond what the federal government standards are whenever necessary to ensure public health is protected. We will continue to work with the City of Flint regarding its future water needs. We are committed to continuing the collaborative process already, in, already established with all levels of government, outside experts, and citizens to resolve the water emergency. We hope that the effective implementation of this approach and the lessons learned will prevent the reoccurrence of such, um, such emergencies in Michigan and other parts of the country. Thank you for the opportunity, and I look forward to your questions. <coughs> Chair, thanks to gentlemen. Thanks each of the witnesses for their testimony. I'll begin the uh, questioning and recognize myself five minutes for that purpose. Dr. Lorry, <coughs> we'll begin with you. Can you uh, talk specifically about the CDC agency for toxic substances and disease registry response on the ground in Flint? What will their role be moving forward? The Agency for Toxic Substances and uh, Disease Research, or ATSDR as it's known, has played the lead role in uh, helping with the analysis of the lead data to date, uh, providing case management services, uh, and helping the state and county with those. And going forward will be instrumental in setting up a registry uh, as well as uh, a uh, strengthen a lead program going forward. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lyon. What changes are you implementing at the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services that will help reduce lead exposure for Michigan's children in the future? And would it be wise for other states to adopt these changes? I think the one of the one of the things we've learned through this and, and part of the education for all of us is the potential impact on these water systems that have the presence of lead. Um, traditionally, really lead in the past has been a public health success. Over the past several decades, uh, the amount of um, lead in children has decreased drastically with the reduction of lead-based gasoline and lead-based paints. But we, we, mean, we now have to be cognizant that there is a new lead danger. Uh, as Dr. Lurie's noted and the Chairman's noted, there is no safe level of blood in lead in the bloodstream. And I think we have to be cognizant going forward of uh, water as a potential source. Uh, as part of what we've done specifically, as part of our lead abatement program environmental investigations, we are looking at water in the households in Flint, and uh, we are looking at fixtures and aerators and things of that nature as part of the environmental investigation and potentially replacing those items if we believe that's the source of the problem. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Beauvais, is EPA performing compliance verifications of drinking water systems under the Safe Drinking Water Act, and was there ever a pause in the use of this authority? If so, when and why? Uh, EPA exercises its oversight of, of state drinking water uh, programs with primacy through a, a number of mechanisms uh, and has done that uh, over the years. Um, we're engaged in a specific effort on lead and copper rule uh, oversight right now where regional offices across the country are meeting with every state primacy agency to ensure that there's appropriate attention and resources being given to lead and copper rule uh, oversight, that lead action level exceedances are being addressed, uh, that corrosion control is being implemented where, uh, where it's supposed to be. Okay, and, and Mr. Cray, um, I've heard about the many testing programs occurring in the city of Flint, the one I'm interested in. Uh, learning more about is the Sentinel program. What is that? Can you give me some additional information about what it is uh, demonstrating? Um, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, I can. So the Sentinel point was where uh, we, in, um, in partnership with EPA, actually identified over 600 sites throughout the city of Flint, looking at a whole variety of factors, using some of Dr. Monhan and Atisha's information on the age of water, where lead service lines were 
uh, where various communities were. And so every two weeks we test those, um, those individual homes. They've been um, actually trained on how to take the sample, making sure you're using wide mouth appropriate flow. And we collect those and then analyze those. And so what that does is it gives us a snapshot, if you will, every two weeks of the integrity and viability of the water system in Flint. And how's the community involved in this? So as we respond to individuals, we have a community member that's hired, a local plumber that is hired, a DEQ inspector, and at times uh, our Department of Health and Human Service or local public health individuals. That's especially true when there's high lead levels above uh, 150 parts per billion, we're in the house within two days. If you're above 100 parts per billion, we're in the house within seven days. And if you're above 15 parts per billion, we communicate with you and ask you to take another sample. Thank you. My time's expired. Chair, recognize the ranking member, Mr. Green, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank our uh, panel for being here. Um, the Safe Drinking Water Act is supposed to ensure safe and reliable drinking water for customers of public drinking water systems across the United States. Clearly, it failed in uh, the citizens of Flint, and we in Congress should be asking why. It seems that the short answer is because the lead and copper rule, or LCR, is in serious need of revision. Mr. Bouvet, what is the status of the revisions for the LCR, and when will they be completed? Uh, we're actively working on uh, developing proposed revisions to the rule. As I mentioned in my testimony, uh, this past December, we received extensive recommendations from our National Drinking Water Advisory Council, as well as input from a, a number of other st uh, concerned stakeholders. So we're carefully considering that uh, that input will be engaging with stakeholders over the coming months to develop a proposed rule and expect to be able to propose a rule in, in 2017. How long has that advisory panel been impounded or, or to get you the information in December? Uh, I believe it was over the course of about a year. So the, the, the NIDWAC or the National Drinking Water Advisory Council formed a, a working group to provide specific advice, which delivered recommendations to the council in August of last year. Uh, and then the council transmitted those recommendations to the administrator in December. And here we are in the middle of April now, and you've had that information since December. Um, because of what's happening in Flint, I think is just the, uh, you know, uh, the uh, a tip of the issue. Uh, is there any way that EPA could actually speed up uh, that uh, the LCR? Well, we we certainly have a sense of urgency about the the revisions. Um, we also want to make sure that we get them right. And in fact, many of the recommendations of the National Drinking Water Advisory Council were developed at a time. Uh, before Flint had really come to light in the national consciousness. So I think um, stakeholders' understanding of where we need to go on, on this is, has, has evolved somewhat. So we're working hard on that, and we're going to get it done as quickly as we can. When, in the meantime, when do you think working. it'll be? Is there an estimated time? Because, again, we're almost four months into the year. Uh, I don't want to prejudge the process. What we've been able to say is that we expect to propose in 2017, and, and I certainly hope that that's as early in 2017 as possible. Well, um, it seems that action levels are not set at levels and to ensure vulnerable populations are protected. Is that, is that a correct statement? I think the specific uh, challenges that occurred in, in Flint uh, have to do with uh, the failure to apply corrosion control as, as should have been done under the existing rule. Nevertheless, we, we do recognize that there's a lot of need for improvement in the rule, uh, and, and we're going to be working actively on that. We're, in the meantime, we are engaging uh, in very close coordination with the states on working to strengthen implementation of the current rule and see where, where states can go beyond the requirements of the current rule to improve public health protections. How well. will the LC LCR revisions ensure pr health protection for children and other vulnerable populations? I'm sorry, could you? How will uh, the LCR revisions ensure health protection for children and other vulnerable populations? Um, well, I think one starting point is the, the National Drinking Water Advisory Committee Council's uh, recommendation, which focus on a number of key areas. Uh, one of them is to uh, have the revised rule uh, require uh, proactive replacement of, of lead service lines by utilities uh, instead of just as a reactive measure. Another uh, proposal is for the agency to develop a household action level, which would trigger notifications to public health authorities if household levels are over a certain. Uh, well, it seems uh, there's a lot of frustration with the fact that exceeding the action level for lead did not actually constitute a violation of the Safe Drinking uh, Water Act. 
The LCR requires corrective action when high levels, high lead levels are found, but does not penalize systems for those initial high lead levels. In other words, the current LCR fails to incentivize protection. Do you expect the new LCR revision to include changes in incentivized systems to prevent lead contamination, not just a remedy if it's found? I do. Okay. Um, I have a number of series of questions, and in, in, uh, in February this year, the ranking member Pallone and uh, Congressman Begette and ranking member Tonko sent a letter to the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services to better understand the role of blood level surveillance in the, uh, in the Flint. The department answered some, but not all of the questions in response dated March 11th of 16. Um, I want to follow up with some questions. Mr. Lyon, it's my understanding you were prepared to answer these questions today. Is that correct? I will do my best, sir. Yes. Okay. In your letter, we asked about July 15th, um, Michigan Health and Human Services memo that observed a spike in blood level, uh, lead levels in the summer of 14 after City of Flint switched the Flint River in the drinking water. However, the Michigan Health, H Health and Human Services officials originally concluded that this spike was seasonal and not related to the water supply. Uh, what led the department to compile the July 15th report? Uh, I received a request from the executive office, the governor's office, sir. Mr. Chairman, I know I'm I just – and why did the Michigan Health and Human Services conclude that the spike was not related to the water supply? Well, I think um, when that initial analysis is done, uh, the staff that worked for me felt that it was there were seasonal fluctuations within that uh, within the data that drove the changes over that first summer. Um, when they compared it to prior years, uh, it was within range of years before, and and obviously we learned uh, once Dr. Um, Mona put her information forward, uh, we worked with her on her data and were able to later prove later show an association of the blood lead increases with the uh, water spikes. Mr. Chairman, I know I'm well over time. I'd like to submit additional questions if possible. Thank you. I'll, and through the chair, sir, I, we will certainly look at your questions and provide a narrative response. Thank you for the additional time. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure his questions are forwarded to you in writing if you can respond. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. And now recognize the uh, chair of the Environment and Economy Subcommittee, Mr. Shamkus, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to direct mine to Mr. Cray. Um, can you speak to uh, schools, daycares, and senior centers um, in Flint? And, the, the, you know, we've mostly been talking about homes. So, uh, yes, sir, we can. And so we've actually tested all the schools um, in Flint, and we've replaced 93% of the fixtures. And one of the questions had to do with lead exposures in schools in Flint, Michigan. There are no lead service lines going to schools, to the best of our knowledge. It's uh, other types of materials, so mainly the, the exposure happened because of the fixtures within those schools, so we have replaced 93% of those. We've gone through a number of deep flushings, if you will, for those schools to assure that when kids come back, hopefully after spring break, they can uh, once again use that water in those um, facilities. Uh, we're not there yet. As we replaced some of the fixtures, we found out that there was some plumbing within the schools that needed to have some further um, renovations. And so we're working very closely with school superintendents. Daycare senior centers? Yes, sir. Those are uh, certainly on the list, and we are doing those. I can't tell you exactly what percentage. I think we're about at 46% of those. So you talked in your opening statement some inconsistencies in the testings across the whole area, and then you've also uh, talked about the Sentinel program a little bit. So when, um, what measures I mean, how are you going to get to a determination when you can make a statement of the water safe again? Since there's, there seems to be hot spots, and I mean, can you talk through that? I mean, I don't know the answer. I'm asking you. Well, the data will drive our decisions, and I appreciate uh, EPA uh, Regional Administrator Bob Kaplan pr brought together uh, a number of the scientists a week ago Monday to look at the data. And the thing that we cannot do is have different interpretation of data. We need to be closely aligned because we've promised citizens certain uh, um, actions without necessarily having that data support those decisions. So I think what you'll see is all of us look at the data. And the data at this point in time says a couple things. It says that soluble lead is getting better. In other words, there's coating in the piping. The particulate lead that gets caught in the aerator is problematic, and that's why it's unstable. The data says that the filters work. 
And the data say that we need to enlist the help of the citizens of Flint to flush their systems thoroughly so that the orthophosphates will, con will continue to coat those pipes. Can you talk about water bill credits for Flint? Yes, sir. No one should pay for unusable water. And so there's $30 million credit that is uh, available to refund or credit towards the water use between April of 2014-2016. About 52% of the bill was for drinking, bathing, and cooking. And so because of the flushing and, and other things, uh, the residents are afforded 65%. We're working with the city. They're trying to perfect the refund and credit mechanism. So at this point in time, that's in the city's court. So there, there is a, a plan, but there is a recognizable delay. Y yes, sir. Um, as the city was going through the records, they wanted to make sure they had clarity, transparency, and that they could answer the questions as the ci citizens r uh, raised them. Let's talk about the uh, communication quality and the rest of the local uh, state and, and federal. How's, what have we done to, I, I think from the outsiders, I'm from Illinois, we're watching this unfold. Obviously, there's a crisis, but the question is how how we improve communication uh, so that we're all moving toward the same objective versus pointing fingers at each other. As Dr. Laurie said, one of the ways to improve communication was through the unified command group, and I appreciate her leadership in that, so that there was not a difference between state, federal, and local government. That's number one. Number two. Uh, Director Line and I have a memorandum of understanding or agreement to make sure we share data across uh, program areas. Number three, we need to be in the community, so we meet in the community every Friday through the Flint Water Interagency Coordinating Committee that I referred to that has both the internal and external expertise so we can honestly debate the data. And then three is we need to embrace those that raise questions and not dismiss them. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I know a lot of people want to ask questions. I'll yield back my time. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the ranking member, Mr. Tonko, five minutes for questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Bove, the most recent EPA drinking water needs assessment is estimated that uh, we need $384 billion over the next 20 years to bring drinking water systems into good working condition. The estimated investments needed for those systems has grown with each succeeding assessment, indicating that we are falling further and further behind. I agree with your statement that we need a serious discussion about how to deal with this national problem. I further believe the funding level for the drinking water state revolving fund is simply too low to offer states the assistance that they truly need to tackle this problem. This committee has received testimony in support of my belief from representatives of different states and systems, both small and large. So I would ask, you know, what is your um, assessment of uh, the states and additional federal funds uh, to reduce the maintenance backlog uh, with their drinking waters? What, what do you believe needs to be done? Well, I think it's clear that we do need increased investment in drinking water infrastructure as well as on the clean water infrastructure uh, side and the, the needs surveys point to those needs. Um, we're working hard within the, the, the levels of resources that, that we have within the, the state revolving funds. Uh, we're wor working closely with states to try to find ways to make that money work smarter and harder through leveraging uh, and so forth. Uh, there's also the opportunity uh, through the Water in, uh, Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act, WIFIA, uh, uh, in the President's budget for 20, FY 2017. Uh, there's a $20 million request uh, which could help to leverage additional resources for low interest loans that could help complement the SRFs. So those are some of the areas in, uh, in which we're working, but strongly agree with you that there's a need for, for more resources and work in this area. Thank you. And, you know, it's obvious that this uh, response in Flint is, uh, is reactive. It's uh, obviously more expensive than a proactive program that would prevent emergencies. Uh, do you agree in that assessment? I, I think there's a there's a common sense uh, response there of, of um, concern with penny wise but uh, pound foolish um, policy decisions which may, might save a few dollars in the in the short term but ultimately have led to some various serious expenses and most importantly the human tragedy that's unfolding uh, in Flint. Thank you. And in the case of Flint, I understand there are, are estimates that up to 40 percent of their treated water may be leaking from the distribution system. That is not only a profound waste of a vital resource, it is economically unsustainable. The water utility cannot collect payment on that water, but I assume they have to charge a rate necessary uh, to 
uh, cover those losses. That problem must be addressed if Flint's water utility is ever to be able to get costs and rates under control. What is the estimated investment needed to bring Flint's drinking water infrastructure up to uh, par? Uh, I don't have precise numbers on what it would take to repair the water mains and, and so forth, but that, that certainly would be an expense uh, well beyond what's, what's involved in possible replacement of the lead service lines. Yeah. I'm hearing some very high estimates, and when I compare that to what's uh, uh, allocated uh, in our SRF, uh, it could take up that whole system. Is, is that your understanding? I, I don't have precise figures, but that, that wouldn't surprise me. Mm -hmm. And the, am I correct in, in understanding that the focus now is on the lead service lines in Flint's distribution system? Well, the, the city has been very focused on, uh, on replacing the lead service lines. I believe that Director Craig uh, made mention of the Fast Start program that the city is engaged in, and, and the city has been in dialogue with the state uh, about potential funding for uh, full lead service line replacements across the city. Mm -hmm. And Director Craig, your testimony states that results from recent sampling have shown that over 92 percent of the households have lead levels less than 15 parts per billion. That is not good enough. But even if water is reliably safe to drink, what steps do you believe are necessary to rebuild trust in government, in their government, and in our water system? As I mentioned, one of the roles of the Flint Water Interagency Coordinating Committee is to make sure we're in the communities working with the community to build that trust. One, two is you have to have outside experts and those that are trust in the community. Part of the solution, like Dr. Monahan and Atisha, like Dr. Mark Edwards, Dr. Renner, Dr. Reynolds, and Dr. Sullivan. So we try to do that. And then three is we need to perform and deliver. And so we are working with the city on reliability studies. We're looking at what is the infrastructure needs for the next decade, not the last decade. Mm -hmm. I know there's been a big discussion about affordability for programs that speak to drinking water. I hear a lot of, un of avoided costs that regrettably are part of the system uh, because of uh, austere thinking. Can you provide an update on the lead service line replacement pilot program? Is there a reliable inventory of lead pipes uh, in Flint? Yes, sir. Those are two different questions. The pilot program that uh, retired General uh, Brigadier, Brigadier General Mike McDaniel did on behalf of the city. Uh, by the end of this week, they should have 33 lines out as proof of concept. Those were more than lead service lines because galvanized lines act as a sink for lead, and that's part of the reason for the particulate lead. So that's a proof of concept that he is doing, and that should be complete. There's then, as I mentioned, $2 million to begin taking out additional lead service lines. They're using the program that the Board of Water and Light in Lansing, Michigan used when they re uh, replaced their lead service lines. And I thank you, Director Cray. I have... Uh, taking up my available time, but there are many questions I have, and I'll submit those to the, uh, the uh, subcommittees for uh, review from well, the uh, individuals. We'll send them to you in writing. With that, I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Upton, five minutes for questions. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. I, we all have uh, a good number of questions. I, the first one that I have, I guess, in listening to the, uh, the response, Mr. Beauvais, to Mr. Green's question, if there was some me one message you could send up the chain is we'd like to have something maybe earlier than 2017. That's a long ways off. And uh, I, w I would like to think that maybe there can be a little extra push uh, to try and get that so communities uh, need can figure out uh, where they need to go. So whether it's a proposed rule or something that can be out there th uh, that can help, uh, I think that would be important. question that I have, I guess, for each of you quickly is, so we passed, uh, as I indicated in my opening statement, H.R. 4470 pretty darn quick. I mean, Mr. Kildee had some good ideas. Uh, we refined them a little bit. We had, I thought, some constructive ideas. Uh, we uh, worked with Mr. Pallone and the committee staff. It was bipartisan. We didn't have the hearings. We didn't have a markup. We moved it right to the floor. And I think, again, the leadership on both sides, uh, we passed it under suspension like that. And, of course, we're, we're waiting for the Senate to, to take some action. It's now been about two months since that happened. So now if, if you had had this extra two months, again, we, we did this pretty, pretty quick, what changes would you make? What, what things have you discovered that we might have missed when we moved that bill so quickly out of here that we might want to think about? Anything? Well, the agency has certainly uh, 
very grateful for the for your and the committee's uh, work on providing additional authority for prompt public notice uh, for systems where there are lead action le level exceedances. Um, I don't have specific uh, suggestions to, to offer at this moment, but we'd be more than happy to provide technical assistance. That would be great because uh, again, it's languished over in the Senate, and there, it's, at some point we're going to, I hope, come together and. Uh, Dr. Lori, and I just want to say too, for for the record, we, you and I have met a number of times. We've had a number of conversations. We really appreciate what you've done. Uh, the directive that you had from the president, uh, your your weekly trips that are there. You're you're working with all layers of government. We appreciate your testimony today and uh, what what you're trying to do. Your expertise. Uh, but I'd be interested in if you have any thoughts in terms of what we might have added. Uh, and knowing that we've uh, been a couple months since we passed this in the House. You know, I think it's, it's a great question. And, you know, my, my first observation overall is that, you know, public health and water are obviously tied very closely together. Uh, a clear message from this is the disinvestment. In the and uh, a clear message, I think, going forward is the importance of preventing exposure by a strong early warning surveillance system to detect elevated blood levels. Uh, stronger surveillance efforts and uh, faster action on the lead mitigation issues. Here, moving forward with a registry to track all kids, uh, finding kids who might be having trouble and being able to jump on them quickly is going to be terribly important. So here's here's a, a, a follow-up question as I watch the clock. How many, what percentage of kids in Flint, knowing that this is a national story, Folks in Flint know about what's it, how many, how many families, how, how many kids have not been tested in Flint what, by a percentage? You know, I am at the beginning of this crisis, and because, I, I mean, Mr. Lyon to help, about 60% of kids on Medicaid had been tested, although there is a universal screening recommendation. Uh, when the more recent testing, most of the lead uh, was probably out of kids' system, but it was very important for us to find any remaining kids who still had high lead levels. Moving forward, testing all kids per the universal screening recommendations and getting on those high lead levels within two weeks is going to be critical. Mr. Mr. Lyon? If she, she's exactly right. We were approximately 60 percent in our Medicaid program. We uh, instituted some um, enhanced elevated blood level testing, uh, especially um, after October 1st when this occurred. We've tested thousands of children. Uh, what we've seen is um, the rate is somewhere below 2 percent. So we were following up with those children, but as been, has been indicated. Uh, 2 percent with higher elevated, with elevated lead levels. 5. 5. 5 percent, okay. Um, with, uh, with that in mind, it doesn't measure past exposure. So what we've done is, is we've really uh, taken our focus and said that we need to have the services in place that could potentially serve any child in Flint because we don't know what their exposure may have been uh, prior to the recent uh, blood testing. Okay. Uh, my time has expired. I'll prepare some other questions uh, for the written record and yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the uh, ranking member of full committee, Mr. Plone, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to ask some questions of the panel, and I'll, I'll be a little more specific, but, you know, my, my major concern, what I hear from uh, our Michigan colleagues uh, is that, you know, we need to address the infrastructure issue because uh, the fact of the matter is that we still have exposure to these lead pipes, and short term and long term, we need to correct that by having systems in place that would allow people to drink the water without having to worry about lead. And secondly, we have all these people, particularly children, who you know, have been exposed to lead poisoning and something needs to be done uh, to treat them, not only now but also in the future. Now, I understand that um, the governor convened an independent group, the Flint Water Advisory Task Force, to review what happened in Flint and offer recommendations for the future, and that this task force offered a number of recommendations, both short and long term, particularly establishing and maintaining a Flint toxic exposure registry to include all the adults and children, and further recommended that all children be offered timely access to age-appropriate screening, clinical, uh, and follow-up for development and behavioral concerns. So 
in the, uh, thinking about what this task force is trying to do to implement these recommendations, I assume they would they would try to do that. Um, what what about the funding? In other words, you know, do, are you, do you have adequate funding to correct the infrastructure both now and in the future so this doesn't happen again in Flint? And um, and and to address the health concerns that will rise with these uh, adults, but particularly children who've been exposed. And that's what I wanted to know. I want to know what because you know we're the committee of jurisdiction. We're not appropriators, but you know obviously we can influence this. I guess I would ask. Uh, let me let me be more specific. Let me start with Mr. Line. Do you agree that? Uh, do you think the current state and federal bud is budget is adequate to address? Uh, the public health activities that I mentioned. Well, I think it, with this issue, especially you know, the investment um, in lead programs nationally has decreased, and I think that's happened at state levels and federal levels. And I think that's something that's a priority that should be revisited. You know, as, as we review the science and we see the studies around uh, lead exposure and how it impacts children um, in the near term, behavioral issues, ADHD in the long term. Uh, the potential links with um, interventions with the juvenile justice system. Um, but let me ask you, Mr. Lyon, do you feel right now you have adequate funding at the state and the federal level to address this in Flint, to address both the infrastructure needs and the public health concerns? I would have to defer to Keith on the infrastructure needs. What I will tell you is that through the Medicaid waiver process and through the thing, through our partnership with the federal agencies and with the governor's commitment, to provide state funding as well, um, we are reviewing that. We know we've we've dedicated more than two hundred million dollars of this to state funds, and uh, the governor is committed to um, maintaining the funding to provide these services in the future. I also want to again thank my federal partners. Um, CDC has been on the ground helping us with many of these investigations. Uh, Dr. Lurie has been there. Um, Dr. DeSalvo is somebody who who's been been very close to the ground as well to assist our staff there, but that's been very important. But if you're asking long term what we're doing with some of these things, there's always going to be competing public health priorities. All right, well, let me, let me let me go to Dr. Lori. So you, you're of the opinion, if I understand it, that you have adequate state and federal funds at this point to proceed. For the near term for what we're looking for, but I, I think right. we're going to revisit that. All right, Dr. Lori, what, you know, we understand that I mean, one of the things that Flint teaches us about the consequences of budget cuts for public health activities. In other words, you know, a lot of this arose because uh, of budget cuts. So, you know, wh what do you, you want to comment on the same question? Uh, are we, should we be concerned that we have a inadequate funding to deal with Flint now and in the future so that we don't have recurrence of Flint problems? Well, I, I very much appreciate the question, and as I said, you know, disinvestment in the public health infrastructure has dire quances, consequences. Maybe not always year one, but it's going to come back and bite you without, without a doubt. Uh, specific to lead and specific to Flint, uh, I think that the Flint situation has shown us that lead in the water is another really important source of lead. And the infrastructure issues make us all need to pay much more attention to lead. So I think, as as Mr. Lyon said, it's important to revisit at this point support for the lead programs, uh, particularly. Well, the I'm lead asking whether or not you think we need we have adequate funding for these so programs. I think in right now, I think uh, the program certainly could be strengthened. In addition, I think we're really looking at wanting to put this registry in place. Uh, in Flint so that we can both monitor kids and learn from the long run. CDC estimates that establishing and maintaining a registry could cost as much as $4 million a year or more. So you think you need additional funds to the tune of $4 million a year? I think that's their estimation for the cost of the registry. Obviously, the Medicaid expansion, the other things are providing additional resources for the direct care of kids in Flint. And I would defer to Mr. Lyon for a more comprehensive assessment of the health and public health needs for Michigan and for Flint, per se. Thank you. Chair, thanks the gentleman. Now recognize the uh, Vice Chair, Mr. Guthrie, five minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cray, first, I want to ask you, uh, I'll ask you if three questions. I'll ask it as one question and get your answer. 
So what is the status of drinking water in Flint today, particularly in lead concentrations? Is it continuing to improve? And when will it be drinkable without all the caveats and boiling and everything? So what is the status? Is it improving and when will it be drinkable? So the data tells you that the quality is improving. The data tells you it is not yet safe because of the particulate lead. And until we go through a comprehensive data analysis and looking at uh, where the lead particles are, there is not a date certain. I mean, is there a rough estimate or time? Um, at this point in time, there's not a rough estimate until the system is thoroughly flushed, and that's where we'll need to have the assistance of Flint citizens to get that accomplished. Thanks. Does Fred want to follow up with something? Thanks. Um, Mr. Lyon, I'd like to, we're talking about uh, spending in public health, and I'm um, one of the things we should have been, spend more in public health infrastructure as well, particularly infrastructure such as this. States are spending an enormous amount of money. I know my state of Kentucky and Medicaid, the growth of Medicaid has, and it's starting to, it is crowding out all the others. So uh, we're looking to reform that program to make it more efficient and more affordable so that we can spend money on things that that matter in public health and, uh, and other aspects. But so on Medicaid, so I've been focusing on Medicaid. So in your written statement, you indicated that Michigan emphasized the need to improve lead testing rates in your recent Medicaid managed care contract rebid. Can you describe what Michigan is doing to improve the rate of lead testing, not only in Flint, but in the entire state? Yes, sir. So <clears throat> we've, we've emphasized blood lead testing um, for several years within our Medicaid program, but as we looked at many of our public health issues and tried to roll those items up into our Medicaid rebid, we're trying to take a more comprehensive look at all things that drive health. So what we're able to do with our rebid is build incentives in for the health plans where if they reach certain metrics or certain measurements, um, then, then they actually can um, work their way into an incentive pool or a bonus pool. So that's what we do. So we, we, are, we are a strong managed care contract state for Medicaid. We believe that that's an effective way to go. We have great health plan partners. So that's what we utilize in trying to do this. They then have relationships with physicians. What we need to do is, is circle back and ensure that we're, we're measuring um, how those health plans are doing with their uh, customers. What I would emphasize, public health is for the entire population. So when you're, when you're looking at population-based activities, um, that's broader than the Medicaid program. Yeah, I understand my previous comments. I understand that public health is broader than Medicaid. Yeah. But med a lot of states are just increasingly spending more and more money on Medicaid, which diverts money from broader public health is issues they can. There's only X amount of dollars states can't print money. Yep. Um, so, so, so you're using, so I w my next question was, what type of outreach is the state or Medicaid health plans doing to encourage families? So I guess you answer that in that you're just giving them target numbers that they have to, mm -hmm. to reach, and, then that, and it's really up to the state Medicaid plans to make these targets work? Or you, is the state doing other kinds of outreach and advertisement and trying to get yeah. families to have their children tested? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Thank you for the question. We have, we have surveillance programs in place centrally, and we also have um, some of the money that um, Dr. Lurie and some of the members were talking about, we target towards our high-risk areas. So there are targeted areas that we uh, really focus on, and, and that's also part of what we're looking at. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that questions I'll yield back. Chair, thanks the gentleman. Now recognize <coughs> generally Ms. Capps, five minutes for question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, to all of our witnesses for your testimony here today. Clearly what has happened in Flint is a tragedy of incredible proportions. While there are many topics I would like to touch on as a school nurse, I can't help but continually go back in my mind to focus on the impact of lead on the children of Flint, and frankly, on too, far too many communities around our country. This is a lesson for us all. I know too well that these environmental and health impacts are gonna have ripple effects in every aspect of every child's life affected by it. As you know, the CDC's Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Program was cr created to address such issues by funding state health departments to screen for children for lead po poisoning. Unfortunately, Congress nearly zeroed out funding for this federal program from 2012 to 2013 and has only partially restored it recently to 50% of its original levels. 
These breakdowns, compounded by cuts at the state level, deeply affect our nation's ability to identify and alert communities of high lead levels. As has been said, we are now reaping the results of this neglect at every level of our life together, especially in our case at the federal level. Something that is not only morally wrong, but that will result in tremendous long-term effects in our country, not to mention costs. For these children and families, the impact of this crisis will be lifelong, and it would only add insult to injury if we stay on the sidelines and refuse to learn from this tragedy or deem it too hard or too expensive to act. We must think critically about the ways we can learn now that it's happened, what went wrong, so that our systems can become stronger in the future. So my first question, Mr. Lyon and Mr. Cray, you've talked about this already, uh, what you are doing to strengthen Michigan's blood level, lead level monitoring programs. But what are the lessons you wish we would learn here uh, and considerations we should take into account how we learn from you and how we can uh, create a, or strengthen a national program? Well, specifically the lead, uh, I believe that stronger surveillance is necessary, um, period. Um, we, we are more active in surveillance in other areas of, you know, cr of um, um, infectious diseases. And, and I don't know if this was a Michigan-specific problem, but one of the things we've done in reaction to this is really ensure that our CLIP program is more aligned with our epidemiologists. Okay. Um, that was part of the restructuring that we did, and it was critical to correct what we were doing. I think another sort of overarching piece, and maybe this will segue into what Director Cray will say, is that we have to be cognizant of health in all policies that we create. We talk about health in all policies. This is a great example of when a, a switch was occurring or something significant was occurring um, where we really considering health. And we talk about that generally in communities where there's health disparities, um, but this is generally you know, it's something that we need to be cognizant of going forward and I think it should inform both state and federal policy makers. Yeah, and if I may, one of the things that we need to have is a very targeted and focused uh, program relative to schools. As we went through the schools looking at what the infrastructure was, it had little to do with lead service lines. It had to do with fixtures in schools. Crumbling schools. Yeah, it, and so that's one. And then two, as Director Lyon said, there needs to be a direct and a robust intersect between the environmental programs and the public health programs because you cannot run those as siloed programs and we're committed to do that. Well, thank you. You are pointing out some very critical issues. Uh, you know, Flint is, is a frightening example of the dangers associated with not investing in public health infrastructure and programming across the country, but it's indicative also of a much larger program. The CDC and the scientific community have established that no amount of lead in the blood is safe for our children. It's estimated that millions of children across our country, not just in Flint, are exposed to lead through paint in their homes, through lead pipes and plumbing and a variety of other ways, particularly older homes and older structures and many older schools. Dr. Lurie, I'd like to turn to you. Uh, is the agency, and I just have a second to get it out if you, if you could respond, is the agency considering any changes to the childhood lead poisoning prevention program? How can we improve surveillance mechanisms so we can identify in real time uh, other communities? Thank you, I appreciate the, the question. Yes, indeed, uh, the agency is looking very closely at how to strengthen surveillance efforts to better detect these kinds of issues in the future, and Flint has clearly highlighted the importance of preventing exposure, having a strong early warning system, uh, and being able to act on that as well. Uh, in addition to uh, revising the guidelines for the program going forward, we're also looking at novel approaches such as new ways to use health information technology to help with these uh, efforts in the future so that we truly have an early warning system and can act on the signals. I yield back, and I hope we can act further on this uh, topic. Chair, thanks the uh, gentlelady. Now I recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Dr. Murphy, five minutes for questions. Uh, thank you very much. I want to pick up on some of the questions that my colleague from California brought up. Uh, Dr. Lurie, with regard to these lead levels, and I've, I've, as a psychologist, I've worked a lot with developmental testing of young children. But with these lead levels that uh, you've evaluated and, and tested, uh, 
what can you expect of the developmental outcome of these lead levels that have been present? You know, I think that's a, a really important question and something we focused a lot of our efforts on. What we know is particularly for very young children that no lead is good for you, but we also know that if you do things to stimulate the brain and focus on early learning, uh, such as uh, early childhood mm -hmm. education, good nutrition, parents reading to their kids, and frequent ongoing behavioral and developmental assessments so that when kids fall off, they can uh, be- I, I, I understand that part they about training. They can catch up. And I'm just asking about the chemical aspect um, of this level. And, and you know, no, no lead copper is good, but I'm with refer uh, referencing that. So this is a situation where uh, there was, it sounds like there was poor corrosion control. This was not, and that, and water companies are supposed to look for this, right? Are, th are they supposed to review the corrosive levels of the water that they're putting into the water system? Is that standard? Does anybody know that? So uh, EPA? I'll ask my EPA colleague <laughs> yes. to, to address that. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, systems are supposed to both uh, to be uh, applying corrosion control treatment and to be monitoring water quality parameters. And in Flint, they weren't doing that. That's right. After in 2014, when the Flint water system switched from previously purchasing Detroit water, which was treated in, in Detroit and corrosion control. So someone was violating this, whether it was the EPA wasn't testing or the committee wasn't testing, someone wasn't following what they should have done. The system did not uh, apply corrosion control after they slipped. Right, so they, the they didn't, somebody didn't do what they were supposed to. I just, I mean, clearly we know that. Is Flint, Michigan the only water system in the country that has a problem like this? I think it's fair to say that Flint, Flint's problems are, um, quite unique and, and unusual in the, the, the notion of a large system like this uh, changing to an untreated water source and failing to provide uh, corrosion control is highly unusual. Um, that being said, it's clear that there are challenges with lead service lines and, and lead levels in, in many systems across the country. Sure. So, uh, and, uh, and, and testing lead levels in people's homes is something that people are allowed to have. They're allowed to request that, correct? And here it happened at some but he did begin to test this out, and that became the, the what, what set this off. Um, <coughs> and we're thankful that happened. But across America, I would suspect from what you're saying that a lot of communities aren't routinely testing their lead levels in water. Dr. Lurie, do you know if that's occurring? Or I'll, I'll take anybody. Ms. I can you can speak to the lead levels in water. I can speak to the lead levels in blood. Okay, in whatever order is preferable. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, for the for those systems that are subject to the lead and copper rule, they are required to monitor for lead levels in in water through uh, right. through tap sampling. In, in but they did, they did, and Dr. Lurie? Yes, and as as uh, many people know, I think that that Medicaid program in general has a set of screening requirements precisely for this reason that there's a recommendation that all one and two year olds be tested. And then there's a recommendation that children three and up be tested if they haven't been tested right. previously, and I, uh, precisely and to detect these issues. And I, and I agree. I mean, I've seen many a child over the years, and I know how important this is. And, and in, in my role as chairman of oversight investigation, we have had company after company in front of us, General Motors, Volkswagen, um, uh, health, health companies, FDA, uh, people who didn't do what they were supposed to do. We, we, Congress puts up these laws. We have regulations. It doesn't happen. And then companies say, can you bail us out? Now, I've, I'm very concerned about the people of Flint, and we need to find a solution for them. But I'm also concerned about the level that's across the country. Locally, my elected officials in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, are still struggling with what the EPA put upon them years and years and years ago with a, with a consent decree. Where the constituents in my area and in, uh, in Mike Doyle's area, who's also a member of this committee, have been told years ago, because the pipes were originally set up that the sanitary sewers and the storm overflow go into the same pipes, you have to replace all the pipes in the county and the city of Pittsburgh eventually. It's costing these communities billions and billions and billions of dollars. And basically, it said, you got to do this. EPA says you got to do it, you got to do it. So the question then comes here is, um, is this something that Flint, Michigan should bear the cost of all these actions, or should the federal government help them out? Well, I think if you're speaking with regard to the infrastructure changes that uh, that need to happen and are, are planned in Flint, it, it really is a st a primarily a state and local responsibility. The assistance that the federal government provides, the, the primary assistance that's available so far is through the state revolving funds, which is one available 
uh, resource that the state has to fund possible infrastructure improvements. There are, of course, ongoing discussions, I believe, both in Michigan and uh, here in the U.S. Congress regarding potential other funding mechanisms. Thank you. I recognize I'm out of time. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen, and now uh, recognizes the gentlelady from Florida, Mr. Castor, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the panel for being here today. I also want to thank uh, the committee for <laughs> calling this hearing because this, the, the Energy and Commerce uh, Committee has jurisdiction over the Safe Drinking Water Act, health matters, environmental matters, and here it is April uh, of 2016, and uh, many people were wondering where the Energy and Commerce Committee was, so I'm glad we're, we're, uh, we finally have this hearing. Uh, Mr. Lyon, at following the April 2014 uh, change of the Flint water source, uh, then in 2015, where uh, families and uh, medical professionals like Dr. Hannah Atisha, who's on the next panel, started to say, there's lead in the water, people have to stop drinking it, the, there needs to be a coordinated response. Uh, at some point after that, the Michigan asked for a Medicaid waiver uh, for health services for Flint children and pregnant women. When did, when did you come together to apply for the Medicaid waiver? Um, actually, I think we submitted our formal application in February. Mid-February, February. approximately, yes. And it was, you had been in discussions for a little while on that? Yeah, we were discussing the potential with... And it was granted... Quickly, I don't know the exact date, but it was, okay. it was, yes. In February? We applied in February. I'm not sure when it was actually approved. Um, okay. But so CMS, CMS did approve it very quickly. If that and this is a, this Medicaid waiver is a technical term, and what it really did is say, we, we need help. We need to, to make sure that the citizens of Flint and the area, children and pregnant women, get the health services that they need. Can you sketch that out a little bit more, why you thought that was an important part of the response. Yeah, I think we wanted to extend benefits to children and pregnant women in Flint because they're most at risk for the impacts of lead exposure. Um, there's two And in fact, low-income communities often are, uh, are more at risk for lead exposure. I'm sorry, what was that? B oftentimes, uh, low-income communities are more at risk for lead exposure. Certainly, that's one of the health disparities that we look at through our programs is that um, where there's older homes and, and uh, more lead-based paint in more impoverished areas, that definitely does have an impact on our urban cores, yes. So is that part of that Medicaid waiver, does the state receive additional dollars to serve a larger population? Yes. How much? I think it's approximately $25 million total, $25 state and federal. Million. And is there a timeline on the waiver and the ex and expanded population, treating the expanded population? Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services has approved the waiver. We're working with our state legislature to get their approval to move forward. And those conversations are ongoing. And I, an I hope and anticipate that they will act quickly so that we can get this up as quickly as possible. So the Medicaid waiver has been granted by the center, Federal Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, but the state legislature has not uh, put up its share because it's a state-federal partnership, is that? That's basically correct. What, what I would say is it's, it's, you know, it's, we have to have the authorization in the funding to do this. And uh, we go through a budget process every single year and that takes some time. So I think there was a, a bit of an inkling that this could be done as a regular part of the budget and we've asked that um, they take a quicker look at this. And so I, and realistically, I think they will. when do you think the legislature will act and do you think they will act? I think we'll hear quickly. I mean, we've been having conversations at, uh, at um, very high levels with leadership and I've been over discussing with them, and they understand the importance of doing it. Okay, so within the next few months, you anticipate? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. So uh, Michigan has a uh, Medicaid managed care system, is that right? You rely upon private plans to, to provide the health services, contract with medical professionals? The end of that cutout, I'm sorry. The and to, to contract with medical professionals for the actual health services? Yes. So how do you ensure that uh, children and pregnant women are actually being tested? And I think it, this kind of goes to the point of the, uh, there seems to be a consensus that Flint's gonna need a registry 
but how do you how do you ensure that the residents the children and pregnant women get the health services they need uh, are the Medicaid managed care companies required to collect data and uh, what else will you need going forward yes they're required to collect data we will work very closely with them in the populations they serve um, we we do outreach with the Medicaid health plans they do outreach to reach out to individuals um, it's a capitated model, so they're interested in increasing uh, their participation so that they have an incentive to, to enroll people. And what I would tell you is it's, it's so important because we have to have people um, identified in the system so that these early interventions can occur. Um, Dr. Lurie talked quite a bit about education. Nutrition is very important, uh, both to stop the absorption, but also to ensure that a child uh, develops in the proper way that they can um, uh, fight off any potential uh, factors that happen. And then the next part of that is is having the screening in place so that if something is indicated, we can get them uh, the services they need. And the, the most important part of this to me is the link to the medical home or the primary care physician and ensuring that uh, um, these children and pregnant women are being seen regularly uh, by their providers. And this allows that access to occur. So in the, the Medicaid waiver that was granted to Michigan that we're waiting on the legislature to to, to act on, does it contain specific conditions that require the, the managed care plans to do that screening and testing and data collection? Yes, we, yes. As Dr. Lurie mentioned, she mentioned the federal standards and, and she could have been reading that right out of our Medicaid manual, uh, ages one and two, and if they haven't been tested, um, ages three and higher. So, and Michigan's intent is to ensure that these children and pregnant women that get their health services through Medicaid are entered into a registry, are tracked over time? We're going to track them. It's something that, you know, anything that we do long term will have to be well thought out because I don't, we haven't done it before. So we'd work with CDC on that. Uh, that would be very important. The other thing I would note that in this situation, too, we have encouraged our health plans uh, to test even younger than one, right? Because we test at one and two because that's when children uh, begin to be mobile and that's when they start. Um, um, interacting with potential so but soil. the overall infrastructure on on data collection and registry is not in place now and that's something you're building right we, now, we right? collect data from the health plans but if we're looking to do a really robust all-encompassing tracking system of these children long term I think it's something that we're gonna have to work with the CDC and CMS um, the local hospitals and the local providers to really get that in place the local uh, behavioral health system as well thank you very much yep Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize Dr. Burgess, five minutes of question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thanks for having the hearing today. Thank you all for, for being here with us this morning and spending so much time with us. I just have a couple of questions, and, and possibly they could go fairly quickly, but uh, Mr. Mobay, let me start with you. The, the lead and copper rule, and I don't, I don't want to oversimplify it, but to me as a relative layperson here, it seems like the lead and copper rule would is the purpose of that to sort of let people know that the water supply is okay from these two agents, lead and copper? Um, is, would, does it function as an early warning system or does it function or could it function as providing a source of, of comfort to people who are relying on their municipal water that at least the lead and copper rule is being complied with so we know we're okay? It, it needs to, the, you know, the way that Congress wrote the Safe Drinking Water Act required to set Standards that are and, and treatment techniques in this case that are feasible. But how how does how does it exist today? I, I recognize you're talking yep. that improvements need to be made, and I, right. I appreciate that. So when the rule was written in 1991, the focus was on what was a technique. What what was a technique that it's a technology-based standard, not a health-based standard. So it focuses on what levels could be achieved by corrosion control. Uh, 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 the application of, of optimal corrosion control techniques across systems uh, and, and the action level was generated off that. But yes, you're, you're absolutely right that the public notice requirements that are in the rule are intended to provide the public with information about how the system is, is performing. So even with the imperfection of the lead and copper rule as it existed a, a year and a half ago, should it have signaled that there is a problem here? Yes, I think first and foremost, uh, to make the, the switch from Detroit water to Flint water required an approval uh, from the state. Uh, and at that time, the system should have been advised to apply corrosion control uh, to the new water source, and that was not done. 
and it's your expectation with the improvements to the rule that you're anticipating these things will be mitigated? That, that specific problem, we've already issued a, a, a memorandum clarifying in case there was any misunderstanding for large systems that that's a requirement. What about just the sort of the ongoing surveillance of, a, of you know, my municipal water system back yep. home? Do they check it for lead and copper? Are they required periodically to do an assessment? They absolutely are. Uh, however, the Flint experience um, has, has brought to light a number of concerns around sampling techniques uh, and approaches, and that's something that we're already focusing on. We've already issued new guidance uh, to states across the country asking them to, to adopt the, the, the most protective sampling techniques, and that's something that we'll be looking at in the course of the, the rule revisions. And who checks the checkers to make sure the checkers are checking? Right. That's that's our challenge in this federalist system. Of I check right. with my municipal water systems, yep. obviously, after this story is on the front page of the newspapers. Yep. Are you doing your job? They are, and I'm grateful for that. The numbers are in compliance. But then, as uh, uh, Mr. Line, as I look at the EPA's map of the city of Flint, Michigan, and see the dots on the map that are published as of April 11th, it is pretty startling. You've got about 60 dots. Uh, equally distributed north and south of the river, and only one of them is in the zero range. Uh, fortunately, not, they're not all in the highest range, but I'm sure they're all in higher range than we would like to see. So that you know, that's a significant problem, which I assume you're you've got on your radar screen, and you're 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 zeroing in on those dots that are the highest intensity. Is that correct? Yes, Director Cray is. He's does the water piece, so it's a map. That you're discussing, he knows about. Well, and I think it's good that but you've yeah, made this. We're you've you've made this aware. public so that people can, yeah. can not real time, but almost real time, assess it for themselves. Mr. Bovey, let me just ask you because you mentioned your testimony, something I'm not familiar with this term. Uh, an EPA wide elevation memo was issued. What is an elevation memo? Uh, I've been on this committee for 11 years. I, I haven't seen that term. That is how we refer to a memorandum that was issued by Administrator McCarthy to all staff at EPA in January of this year, uh, really highlighting the critical importance that in situations where there's an understanding at a staff level in particular that public health may be at risk, uh, that staff take the initiative to elevate those is issues to higher levels of management and that we work collectively as, as managers and leaders across the agency to ensure that we're creating an environment where that, that happens and, and is welcomed. Can you share with the subcommittees involved the internal memoranda that related to that elevation memo being issued? Absolutely. And um, just finally, there will be a, an EPA OIG report that is that is generated as a result of all of this. Do you know when that's going to be made public? Um, I prefer to let the Office of Inspector General speak to the timing of that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll you back. Mr. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. And uh, I have a UC request from Ranking Member. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to place in the record a statement from the American Public uh, Works Association, the o Depart Ohio Department of Health, uh, Director of Health, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and also the National Medical Association, as you ask, consent to place in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Chair, now recognize Mr. McNerney, five minutes for questions. Well, thank you, Chair. Uh, one of the important lessons from the tragedy in Flint is the importance of investing. Of course, in this case, it's in corrosion controls. Uh, what, seem, might, what may seem like a low-priority investment could uh, avoid long, uh, large public debt in the future. Uh, Mr. Bovis, what exactly is concro uh, corrosion control and are, are there different types of corrosion control for different water systems? There are different types of corrosion control and the application of corrosion control really depends in significant part on the chemistry of the source water uh, as well as the configuration of the system. So one common method of, cor uh, of protecting against corrosion is the addition of orthophosphate, uh, which is what's being done in the Flint system now, and, and that effectively uh, provides a coating on uh, any lead service lines or, or pipes in the system to prevent le leaching of lead into the water. Um, other techniques involve uh, adjusting the pH uh, of the water to reduce corrosion of, of those, those so systems. I, I realize that Flint is unique. Uh, do we have to worry about lead poisonings in other uh, communities because of corrosion of pipes? 
of lead pipe? In, in any system that had, has lead service lines or lead uh, premise plumbing, uh, it's, it's important to apply uh, techniques to, to avoid that corrosion, and, and certainly this is a challenge for many communities across the country. So is EPA doing anything to incentivize adoption of corrosion control in other communities? Well, the, in fact, the lead and copper rule requires it, and, and so one of the things that we're doing, we recently issued a, a new uh, uh, technical resource uh, to help walk communities through how to do corrosion control to update pre-existing guidance, uh, and our regional offices, as I mentioned earlier, are engaged with every primacy state across the country uh, to ensure that they're taking a close look at any lead action level exceedances. And, and this and crisis has caused other communities to be, be more aware of the problem, I take it. Absolutely. There's, uh, there's definitely a strong focus on this now, and I'm, I'm sure members of the, the second panel will also speak to that. Okay. What more could Congress do to encourage water systems to make those kind of investments? Um, well, I think that the, the oversight that Congress is providing and the attention that Congress is helping to bring to the issue is certainly helpful. Um, you know, we appreciate any uh, support that we can get for our efforts to strengthen implementation of the, uh, of the rule now as we engage with, with states and water systems across the country. Uh, and of course, this will be an important element of the lead and copper rule revision. So we, we appreciate the, the committee's strong support for moving forward with that. Very good. Well, co corrosion controls are only one part of what the city of Flint needs to do uh, to operate its water system safely and sustainably. For example, uh, Mr. Craig, uh, you mentioned that the city is losing large amounts of treated water in its distribution system every day. Now, uh, being from California, we have a water crisis almost every year, so this is an issue that we care about very deeply as well as contamination. Uh, what do you recommend? So we're working very closely with EPA and the city, looking at the reliability study, doing hydraulic monitoring, doing tracer studies to figure out how long the water's in the system and how best to address those concerns for the community. So there's, there's technology out there that is good at detecting these leaks? Yes, sir. Okay. Is it pretty expensive to implement that? The uh, monitoring technology, I wouldn't say, is the expensive part. The, r the right sizing the infrastructure would be the um, cost there um, concern. Thank you. Well, as we look to the future, we must invest aggressively in our water infrastructure. I think everybody knows that. We need to do so in a sustainable way. Uh, this should include incentivizing corrosion controls, water loss audits, and other methods to ensure that our water systems can provide safe and affordable water well into the future. Um, the EPA uh, is committed uh, a couple a year ago to developing health-based household action level for lead to help parents, pediatricians, and local officials understand the risk to formula-fed infants so they can protect children. Why hasn't the EPA um, issued this level yet? Uh, in, in fact, that was a recommendation that we just received from the National Drinking Water Advisory Council this past December, uh, and we are, in fact, actively working on that. So you're not overdue on that recommendation? It, it really was a recommendation that came in the context of the lead and copper rule revisions, and, and we're actively working on it. It's, that's a, a, a somewhat complex scientific endeavor that will require peer review and so forth. So you're not ready to give a commitment as to when you're going to release that information, that value? I can't. I can only say that we're working actively on it, and, and when, when, when a product is ready for, for peer review, that'll, that'll be done. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Chair, thanks to the gentleman. I recognize the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley, five minutes for questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've got a couple questions, Mr. Beauvais, if I could start with you on it. Uh, maybe the first you're not going to be able to answer, but if you could get back to me, and that is, in your testimony, you say there are 68,000 water systems in America. Um, I've asked this question of other panels on this. Could you, and no one's gotten back to me, but I'd like you to get back to me. What would be the breakout of communities, let's just say rural communities, of 5,000 or fewer out of that 68,000? Could you get back to me on that? Absolutely. I, um, I, I think I can probably if give you, could, you a. Because you're not going to be able to give that to me right now. But I, we are looking for some kind of breakdown on the 68,000. How many of them are coming? Because in the rural communities, they're often they're going to be poor, perhaps, uh, less affluent, perhaps. Um, so they're going to face some other difficulties as we deal with this problem. Uh, I'd also like to know from you, if you could, um, put together something that, and based on the 1986 uh, uh, Safe Drinking Water Act, um, the 
the number of homes that were constructed prior to 1986, I've got to think that that's going to be the majority of homes built in America, uh, especially in rural areas that, that um, they're going to have older homes there that, that, that could have because could have internal lead inducing issues with it. Uh, so that leads to the next question of, um, I, I, I think I'm, you're going to answer the question of positive, and that is, are our plumbing fixtures, our lead solder, our galvanized pipe, just piping in general, our distribution within a house, even if we have the freshest, cleanest water coming into the home, aren't we possibly subjecting the homeowners and the, and the people that live in there, the children and all, aren't they going to be subject to higher lead, lead levels as well? Premise plumbing is certainly part of the issue. The lead service lines, that, the, the laterals that connect the water mains yeah. to the homes are one big concern, but premise plumbing can also be a significant. Okay, I'd like to understand more of that significance on that. Um, um, you know, I, I often refer to uh, uh, Mildred Schmidt. She's your neighbor, she's my neighbor. Mildred Schmidt, when, when, when this issue was raised, contacted the EPA to find out what do I do? I, I, I've heard it on Fox News. I've heard it on the news. I've got a problem. What am I supposed to do? And she's fortunate enough they have the Internet because that's what everyone tells you. You're supposed to go to the Internet, and she may or may not have Internet access. But if she does have it, this is what she got was this one-inch thick panel of papers that she's 82 years old, and she doesn't know what to do with that. So She's overwhelmed with this. It's not a user-friendly system that we have set up for people, Mildred Schmidt, to be able to address this problem. She, she doesn't know whether she has a problem or not. And so I, I'm, I'm trying to understand, we've known about this problem apparently since 1986. And it goes far beyond Flint. What is, what's, what differentiates this lead problem that manufacturers in solder, fixtures, plumbing lines, distribution systems and like, what differentiates them from all the other settlements of litigation that we've had across this country over things? I, I just was listening to the cigarette manufacturers, $206 billion settlement on that. Uh, the uh, mesothelioma, uh, the asbestos issue that was $30 billion that the manufacturers had to come up with. Uh, airbags, thalidomide, Corvair auto, ignition switch, engine coolant, breast implants, all of these manufacturers have had to step up and take care of this. But we look over to the manufacturers of a lead-induced system in our homes and we're letting them pay no responsibility. What, what differentiates that? Why aren't they involved in helping out the homeowners, whether it's in rural America, rural West Virginia or elsewhere? What, what, what's your response to that? I think it's a very good question. I, I, it's not something that I've thought about before, but I would be happy to, to, to give it some thought and get back to you. Not that I'm trying to get litigation started on this, but I don't understand the difference. If these homeowners don't know, Mildred Schmidt doesn't have two nickels to rub up against each other, and she may hit, be faced with something that could cost five or $10,000 to fix the lead problem in her home. What's she supposed to do? She's living on Social Security. I think we've got a real serious problem here as we relate to homeowners. So. I'd really like to hear back what some solutions would be. Is this something government should step up, or is this a manufacturer should take care of it? So I've run out of time, apparently, and, and uh, so if you, if any of the rest of the panel, if you can get back, I'd sure like to know which direction we want to go in this, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognizes Mr. Lujan, five minutes for questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I've been dismayed by the events that have unfolded in Flint, Michigan, which are deeply tragic because all of these could have been prevented. It was all preventable. And, and that's what I, I just heard from my colleague as well from West Virginia. That's where this frustration is coming from. And so I also hope that the crisis in Flint serves as a wake up call to all of us in Congress and all across America that public health vital programs cannot be cut, that protections that should be in place should not be eliminated. Um, I'm reminded as we're hearing this debate uh, Mr. Uh, Bove, that uh, we, there's questions about the standard set with the clean water drinking standard. And when there was a breach about a year ago in New Mexico and Colorado in the Animas River, it turned orange. There were heavy metals flowing through it. 
And we were told in New Mexico that it met the clean water drinking standard. I don't know one of you that would have picked up a glass of water out of that river that day and put it into your body. We've got to look into this stuff because if it's making people sick and killing people, um, we've got to get our hands around it. So with that being said, I'm trying to understand what's going on in Flint and across the country, uh, but it's become apparent that there's a lack of good data on where kids are being exposed to lead. In my home state of New Mexico, I've become increasingly concerned by the risk level for lead exposure faced by many of our counties. New Mexico has received three-year funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for Lead Poisoning Prevention Programmatic Activities. However, just this week, the Associated Press analysis of data from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the New Mexico Environment Department found that 20 small water systems across the state of New Mexico have exceeded the federal lead standard at least once in the last five years. This is truly alarming, and I know, Dr. Lurie, that you share that uh, concern with me. Is it true that the federal government does not require states to submit lead exposure data? So I think as, as we have been uh, looking at how to strengthen the lead program, uh, one of the things and improvements we've been talking about is publicly posting uh, lead data, and obvious in a way that provides uh, anonymity for patients, but makes clear what the levels uh, and end issues are. And as we look forward to strengthening the lead program in general, I think we very much look forward to working with Congress on a set of proposals to do that. So, Dr. Lurie, the answer to that question is no, the federal government does not require states to submit. Does not require states to submit. Lead exposure data. No. Um, do you believe that the variability between state reporting standards makes it difficult for decision makers to understand the level of lead exposure risk across the country? I'm not totally sure that I understand your question, it's but it does, it does seem as though there needs to be uh, readily understandable, interpretable, standardized data that let us all uh, be able to act. That's the essence of the question, Dr. Lurie. It's my understanding that there's not a standard for how states even report this, that from one jurisdiction to the next, the data that's being reported is very different. And so there needs to not only be a requirement that this data be sent to the federal government, there needs to be a standard that is established as well. And what steps should be taken to strengthen state and federal programs to screen children for elevated blood levels? So in the first part of your question, I'd really like to get back to you uh, on the facts because that's not a level of detail that I'm familiar with. Uh, on the state and local level otherwise, uh, there is a very good Medicaid standard, for example, about screening, but I think we also know that while there have been vast improvements over the last uh, you know, decade or so, and we're up to somewhere on the low 60% for Medicaid screening. We're really looking toward universal screening of young children to be sure that we can catch kids with lead and strengthening the surveillance programs and potentially even automating some of those systems so that we can have an early warning system uh, that is in real time and is better is, is a real focus of the discussion going forward. I think you just described, Dr. Lori, why the, there's such an importance with preventative care with with screenings and with checkups on a regular basis so that we were able to catch as much of this as we can as early as we possibly can. And then lastly, as my time runs out, Dr. Lori, I just want to appreciate the uh, attention that you brought to the behavioral and mental health aspect of this. There are too many people that um, have been traumatized over this and the emotional toil that has been experienced is dramatic. It also brings us back to the importance of what needs to be done for mental and behavioral health programs. So. Thank you so much for your time today for this important hearing, Mr. Chairman. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now, I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, five minutes for questions. Thank you very much. The two witnesses from Michigan uh, reference Dr. Mark Edwards of Virginia Tech. I'll ask each of you, uh, it's kind of a yes or no, except it's not, a uh, question, and that is Dr. Mark Edwards, hero or gadfly troublemaker? We'll start with you, Mr. Bovet. Well, uh, Dr. Mark Edwards, the collaboration between EPA and Dr. Edwards has been uh, has been extremely useful to us. So he sh he surely is a hero in this. Uh, in this. Dr. Lurie. Similarly, he's been a very important collaborator and someone who's also earned the trust of the community in important ways for moving forward. Mr. Lyon. Uh, not only would I want to recognize Dr. Edwards for his work, but I want to recognize um, Dr. Hanna Atisha, who's going to testify later. Um, their independent look at this certainly brought us around, so thank you. Mr. Cree. I'd echo Director Lyons, uh, to thank both those doctors for, for providing the leadership to resolve this issue also. All right, so here's the problem. 
because he dropped everything he was doing, didn't teach class. He, in fact, in an article that appears in the run of Times today, he says he's not sure why Virginia Tech still has him on staff because he hadn't taught any classes, hadn't had time to write grant money, spent $250,000 out of their funds, uh, five years' worth of man hours uh, working on this project. They've got a cash flow problem and, in fact, have set up a GoFundMe page, Flint Study VT, uh, trying to raise money to offset the work that they've done. I ask each of you, do your programs, do your agencies have a fund available? And to the folks in Michigan, I would say if you don't have a fund available, you have a full-time legislature, if I remember correctly. Perhaps a bill ought to be put in to help uh, offset or defray some of these costs. I don't know about the other person that you mentioned. She's not my constituent. But uh, when I read an article about one of my constituents who has done the right thing for another part of the country and expended uh, funds that have now put them into a little bit of a financial uh, whole, uh, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, so if, again, Mr. Bovet, just because you're at that end of the table, if you'd start, are there funds available to EVA to help defray these costs? Uh, well, in fact, we have provided support to some of Dr. Edwards' recent uh, work in, in Flint. I would have to look into the kinds of funds that are available, but I'm not um, aware that we've received any requests for funding. I understand. Mr. Lyon, and, and either one of you can speak for I Michigan. Mr. Lyon. So so I, so I do know that that's a direct conversation uh, being held in Michigan to see how we can uh, support Dr. Edwards and his research. We All right, appreciate I appreciate that. that very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I might, I'd ask unanimous consent for that article from the Roanoke Times in today's paper to be submitted to the record. Without objection, it's ordered. And uh, let me move on then to the uh, other newspaper articles that I've read. Miguel Del Toro. Uh, according to some recently released emails and an article that I read out of the Detroit News uh, back at the end of March, indicated that it w in an email that was released that at one point in time he had offered to do more tests in Flint, Michigan on his own dime to prove that, his, that, that what he was saying up the chain, that there's a problem here, would come out. I, I have to wonder if the EPA's just got too much bureaucracy uh, when they can't even listen to their own people in the field and they're, they're offering to do it on their own dime, and instead they get the, the stiff arm. I know you didn't have anything to do with that, but Mr. Bouvet, what are we going to do in the future? I mean, that's what this hearing's about, to make sure that when your own people are saying there's a problem, they're not just totally dismissed, and in fact, it would appear punished. Again, I know that's debatable, but it appears that he was punished for a short period of time. Uh, well, f first of all, let me just say that uh, Miguel Del Toral is uh, an incredibly valued member of, of EPA's team, one of, one of the national experts in this area. Uh, I'm not aware of any, any punishment of him, but I, 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 but I, uh, I do think that it's, it is very important that concerns that get raised at a staff level be appropriately elevated and, and get a appropriate attention, and that's, uh, that's precisely the point of the, the policy memo that was discussed. And I know your position, and I'm not fussing at you, but I will tell you in another hearing that I attended, not this committee, uh, in regard to this, uh, the, the mom, the hero mom in this situation um, was told that he'd been dealt with and he disappeared for a period of time because he'd been dealt with. Uh, I consider that a form of punishment. EPA may not consider it that, but I do. And that's the kind of thing that bothers me when we have folks saying that we need more money. And, and I'm sure there's always use for more money. But if you just listen to the folks on the ground, you, you could have stopped this problem sooner. And that's my concern as a federal representative talking to the federal representatives of the EPA. You all had a chance. You missed it. Not trying to bust your chops, but I want to make sure you all get the system right so when this happens again, because the same article in the Roanoke Times says they're looking at Philadelphia. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Time's up. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing. Um, I was uh, one of a pretty large delegation that went to Flint last month. I know Dr. Lurie um, was part of the, was one of the presenters and was there. I don't know if I met the others of you um, when we had 25 members uh, led by Leader Pelosi, the Congressional Progressive Caucus, the Congressional Black Caucus for a speak out. Um, but we also had a panel and, and had an opportunity to, to see the um, incredible resources that were pulled together at that point um, to, to really uh, address the, the, the problem. And obviously, um, nothing is too much for us to do to um, correct this problem. And it's not 
really contained to the city of Flint. There may be some particular circumstances, uh, as, as was mentioned, but um, cities across the country have these aging water systems, um, these underground infrastructure problems that, and there could be uh, lead. I know in, in Chicago, because so many kids live in homes with lead paint, the latest data we have through the city of Chicago shows that in 2014, approximately 675 children had elevated levels at 10 times the, uh, the amount. But I think that's really underestimated. We don't do a, a lot of, uh, uh, of testing. Um, so um, Dr. Lurie, as a key part of the, the state's response, and this has been discussed somewhat in Flint, was its application of a, uh, for a med Medicaid waiver to extend Medicaid coverage to thousands of children and pregnant women uh, in Flint to ensure that our most vulnerable receive the comprehensive and ongoing care that they need. And thankfully, this waiver was, uh, was approved. The coverage provided through this new Medicaid waiver, which also eliminated premiums and cost sharing and broadened case management benefits for all the beneficiaries in Flint is clearly going to make a difference in the lives of Flint residents from year to com years to come. So I, I'm wondering if you could speak to why Medicaid coverage in particular was and continues to be such a vital part of the broader federal response in this situation. Thank you. I appreciate the question. And as, as we've discussed, one of the situations we had here is that we had all kids in Flint exposed to the Flint water system and all kids in Flint and families in Flint you know, potentially exposed to uh, very concerning levels of lead. Medicaid is the healthcare infrastructure, particularly for low-income people in this country. It not only provides, however, access to basic healthcare. In this case, Medicaid is a terrific solution because it also can provide, through expanded services, case management, behavioral and developmental services, and other things like transportation for people who have difficulty getting to medical care. So if, in fact, we want to get kids in to see a primary care provider to their medical home and help them use the services that are available to them, often we need case management, transportation services, as well as all the other things we call wraparound services, um, the developmental behavioral services, the home visiting, all of those things that are required to be sure kids get what they need. So that's on the list of things that now are available. How's it going in Flint? Well, so right now, uh, we are waiting for I the state legislature to approve the Medicaid expansion so that we can actually get those services mm -hmm. off the ground. Uh, we understand uh, from the state that that is coming. And meanwhile, uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services and all of us are looking at ways to to lean forward both to monitor uptake, but to be really proactive within the community about being sure that people know the services are available and are able to take advantage of them. Many, many community organizations on the ground poised and ready to get kids enrolled. So um, the legislature in, in Michigan has to uh, approve this. What's the timeline there? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, um, we're working with them at this point, daily, on, on getting their approval to do this. So it's something that, that we're working on. Uh, it was what I referenced a little bit earlier. It's, it's They were looking as part of the budget request where it would have taken a little bit longer to get this in place. Uh, we've asked them to, to expedite that. And, and we are ready to implement as well. So um, there's some technology up revisions that will have to happen. There's some things that will have to occur, but um, it should be a pretty quick implementation time frame once we have that. Option. Now, is this um, administered in the same way or funded in the same way that Medicare is with the state match as well as the uh, federal dollars? The same way that Medicaid is matched with the state uh -huh. dollars, yes. Uh -huh. So um, do you have any expectation on when the money can be approved? Um, I would want to be careful speaking on behalf of the state legislature okay. uh, for obvious reasons. But again, I think you know, we have an education process we're doing with them. Um, they had a lot of other priorities in front of them as well, and we've gotten to the right people to assure that, um, that decisions can be made quickly. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Chair, thanks, gentlelady. Now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Villarocas, five minutes for questions. 
Chairman. I appreciate it. And thanks to the panel for your testimony. Uh, the first question would be for Mr. Bore. Uh, I pronounced that right, correct? Yes, that's right. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that the EPA's role is to maintain federal oversight of the state's drinking water programs. Uh, why then didn't the EPA intervene after numerous, numerous violations, including the complete absence of corrosion uh, control treatment by the city of Flint? They were, it was noted uh, apparently in the June 2015 by Mr. Dale DeRalls. Why didn't the EPA intervene? Uh, well, in fact, the EPA staff were intensively engaged with their state counterparts uh, from the period as, as soon as they, they were initially told that corrosion control was being applied uh, and then later informed that it, in fact, was not being applied. At that, from that point in time, EPA was intensively engaged with, the, with state count counterparts at MDEQ. Ultimately, when, uh, when, when can you give me a date on that? Um, EPA, EPA was informed in uh, April of 2015 that corrosion control was not being uh, applied. Uh, a, an, a, a series of, of engagements uh, ensued by, by July uh, of 2015. MDEQ had indicated that it would, uh, actu that it would go and ask uh, Flint to apply corrosion control. Thank you. Next question, sir. Uh, there have been uh, Safe Drinking Water Act violations in several states, including my home state of Florida. Uh, what administrative steps has the agency taken to ensure that similar problems that may occur across the country are acted upon uh, quickly, of course, and do not lead to another public health crisis? Um, well, we, we focused on two key actions that are closely related to one another. One is that our regional offices are engaged with every single state drinking water program that has primacy across the country to review all of the data with regard to lead action level exceedances to ensure that those are being addressed and that corrosion controls being applied where needed uh, and that any other steps uh, that, that need to be taken are taken. The second is that we sent letters to every governor and every state drinking water regulatory agency head uh, for the primacy states in the country. Uh, asking them to focus appropriate attention and resources on this, asking for a series of concrete steps, both with regard to implementation of the rule and increase, increased uh, transparency and accountability in the way that sampling results uh, and other information are being provided to the public. Thank you. Uh, next question. Well, while lead uh, levels are improving, Flint water still exceeds federal standards and virtually all homes must still be considered at risk. Do you have an estimate as to when drinking water in Flint will be back in compliance with the safe drinking water standards? Um, I, I think I would share the, the view that Director Cray articulated earlier, which is that I, I don't feel that we can hazard a guess as to the timing at this point in time. Directionally, things are improving, and we really need to be guided by the data and, and the experts in assessing when, when we're back to a, a situation where it's safe to drink. Well, can you get back to us on this? Absolutely. We, we're happy I to keep you advised. Experts uh, stress the importance of water use in homes so that the orthofall state uh, and chlorine added to improve the water quality flow through the, the pipes. Uh, given that many Flint residents are hesitant to run their water, and you can't blame them, uh, whether it be for safety or financial reasons, and that there is a growing vacancy in the housing market, how will a flushing program be successfully implemented? Um, well, I want to give uh, Director Cray an opportunity to respond to this as well. I think that's exactly the, the, the challenge that we're now grappling with, is both to identify an appropriate protocol uh, and then to uh, develop an approach uh, to, to make that happen on the ground. And of course, I think the, the question of, of water bill forgiveness is, is certainly going to be an element of that discussion. Director? Uh, yeah. Certainly agree with Mr. Beauvais. Um, our staffs are working together to agree upon uh, with uh, Dr. Edwards on an agreed upon uh, flushing protocol and then uh, there's uh, high level conversations looking at um, forgiveness of any of that uh, cost because we do need to have the citizens participate in this effort. Okay. Director, I have a question for you. Uh, do you believe that those in your agency appointed or otherwise have the necessary training and or certification for managing the city's a drinking water system with regard to implementing and enforcing regulations mandated by the Safe Drinking Water Act? I think it goes beyond the technical training of staff, and that's one of the reasons why we're exploring apprenticeship programs with the American Water Works Association and some of the municipalities so that 
employees to get more hands-on training so they understand what happens inside the plant and the results of their actions. Right, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Appreciate Chair, it. Chair, thanks the gentleman. And now recognize the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Harper, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to each of you. And it appears that I'm the last person to ask questions. So uh, thank you for, for uh, being so patient on this. Mr. Uh, Beauvais, uh, I know you following up on some questions that Mr. Green had uh, asked earlier and Chairman Upton had uh, followed up with. Uh, about that EPA intends to make long-term revisions to the lead and copper rule, question about when. What are the key issues for EPA in hammering this out? Uh, well, I think some of the key issues relate to lead service line uh, replacements. That's a very, um, without getting into all the, the gory details, that's a very complex uh, and, and challenging area because of the way that ownership and control of lead service lines uh, works and the ex expense associated with lead service line uh, replacement. So that'll be one of the key issues to grapple with. Uh, another, for example, is the, the recommendation of the development of a household action level uh, that would be used to trigger uh, notification and intervention from public health officials. Uh, and there's, there's a series of others which I, I'd be happy to outline. Sure. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, does EPA have any concerns about National Drinking Water Advisory Council recommendations? And if so, which ones? Um, I wouldn't say concerns. I, I guess what I would say is um, we've, we've also had, um, we've received uh, recommendations and input from a number of other uh, concerned stakeholders. There was a dissenting member of the, of the council who submitted a, a separate uh, opinion or, or set of recommendations. Um, and the other thing to mention is just that, uh, as I was saying earlier, the working group, the lead and copper rule working group's uh, recommendations that ultimately came up through the council were really developed before the whole experience in, in Flint came into the national consciousness in the same way. So we've, we're learning a lot on the ground and we're learning a lot as we engage uh, across the, the country and, and that'll also uh, influence our thinking on the proposed rule. You know, as you, you said, there's a lot of data coming in that's got to be evaluated, reevaluated, and continuing input that's going to go on that. But what what does what does go beyond the requirements? Um, well, well, one of the uh, one of the things that we've asked uh, the state regulators to look at and, and drinking water system operators to look at is uh, the current rule, for example, doesn't require uh, public posting of the spe the individual sampling results. Regulators are required to uh, uh, report to us the 90th percentile uh, results, but we really felt uh, strongly that that. Um, consumers and, and, and resident citizens uh, would benefit from having that information be, be made publicly available. So that's, that's one area. Um, we've we've uh, provided some information on recommended sampling uh, protocols that are not, strictly speaking, uh, regulatory requirements of the current rule, but we've encouraged people to adopt those as, as more pr uh, protective. And, and there's a couple of other areas as well that we've focused on. Right. And uh, Mr. Beauvais, one of the uh, other cities that has uh, received some national news is Jackson, Mississippi, in my district as well. Uh, and uh, I know that city officials have been working with EPA uh, during this time, and we certainly appreciate that assistance. Uh, in your testimony, you state that Administrator McCarthy has called for an IG investigation to investigate EPA's response to the Flint crisis. Do you know when that uh, IG investigation and report will be completed? I, th I think I'll have to defer to the Office of Inspector General on the timing of their, uh, of their report. On February 29th, the EPA sent a letter to ensure water systems are following the lead and copper rule uh, to the Mississippi State Department of Health and agencies in each state across the country to enforce that rule. Uh, in it, uh, EPA asked the states to work with public water systems with a priority emphasis on large uh, water systems. Uh, to increase transparency and, and implementing the lead and copper rule by posting uh, that information. What, any idea why there was uh, an emphasis put on large water systems or just the, the sheer volume of customers or is it a starting point or what, explain that. I, I think something in the nature of triage, this is a, you know, this is a, a huge level of effort uh, that needs to be made by state drinking water system operators and so there was an encouragement to start with large systems uh, and then kind of work, work down the stack. Um, we understand there are a number of unique challenges that small systems uh, face and it's important to grapple with those as well. I think we all understand uh, the importance of, uh, of clean drinking water and uh, we want to say we appreciate the assistance and uh, look forward to a resolution with that I yield back. Thank you. Chair, thanks the gentleman. Uh, at this point, the uh, members' questions 
are concluded. We'll have follow-up questions we'll send to you in writing. We ask that you please respond uh, promptly to that. And so uh, at this point, we're going to take a short break while the staff sets up the witness table uh, for our second panel. Uh, the subcommittee will stand in recess for three minutes.
right, the time of recess having expired, the subcommittee will reconvene. We'll ask our second panel to please take their seats at the witness table. I'll introduce them in the order of their presentations. First of all, <clears throat> Dr. Mona Hanna-Tisha, MD, MPH, Program Director, Pediatric, Pediatric Residency, Hurley Children's Hospital, Hurley Medical Center, Assistant Professor of Pediatrics, Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Welcome. Second, Joan Alter, Executive Director <clears throat> at the Center for Children and Families, Georgetown University. Welcome. Mr. Steve Estes Smargiazzi, Director of Planning and Sustainability, the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority. Welcome. June Swallow, President and Administrator, Rhode Island Drinking Water Program, Rhode Island Department of Health. Welcome. Finally, May Wu, Senior Attorney, Health and Environmental Environment Program, Natural Resources Defense Council. Thank you for coming, each of you. Uh, your written testimony will be made a part of the record. You will each be given five minutes to summarize your testimony. Um, our little light system is not working, so they're on the floor and uh, along with the wires. So be careful, anyone walking, not to uh, step on the wires. But at four minutes, I'll give you a couple of taps to give you a, a signal that you've got one minute left of your five minute uh, testimony. And uh, please ask you to wrap it up at five minutes. So, <clears throat> um, we'll start with Dr. Mona. You are, will be recognized now for five minutes to summarize your testimony. You're recognized. Thank you. Good afternoon now. I'd like to begin by thanking Chairman John Shimkus and Chairman Joe Pitts, along with Ranking Member Paul Tonko and Ranking Member Jean Green, for the opportunity to testify today at today's joint subcommittee hearing on the Flint water crisis and, most importantly, on the plan to move forward. I would also like to thank Chairman Fred Upton from Michigan, Ranking Member Frank Pallone, and the respective staff members for their continued interest and work on this issue. This is a very important topic, and I am pleased that two subcommittees have chosen to devote devote today's joint hearing to the public health situation in Flint and the long-term needs of our community. It's been said that pediatricians are the ultimate witnesses to failed policies. And as a pediatrician in Flint, I can attest to that. Our children were failed by every agency that was supposed to protect them. I'm not going to go into the details. You know what happened with Flint. A uh, lack of corrosion control created a perfect storm for lead to leach out from our plumbing into our drinking water and into the bodies of our children. There is no safe level of lead. Lead is a potent, irreversible neurotoxin that impacts our children for decades and generations to come. The treatment for lead is to prevent all exposure to lead because there is no magic pill for lead. There is no lead antidote. So since we were able to prove that lead was getting into the bodies of children, our focus has always been on their tomorrows and what are we going to do next for our kids. And we are focused on that moving forward. Flint is an incredibly resilient community with a proud past and we are hopeful and determined to create an even more promising future. Our com community is committed to rebuilding and to creating a sanctuary where our children can recover and flourish. We cannot wait to see the potential cognitive and behavioral consequences of lead exposure. We must act and we must act quickly. We are grateful for the state and the federal support that has come in thus far. And while these are uh, helpful and appreciated, most are unfortunately only temporary expansions or increases in funding and will not adequately address the long-term needs of Flint's children. On the academic side, Michigan State University and Hurley Children's Hospital have launched something called a Pediatric Public Health Initiative. This is our model public health program, a center of excellence, almost ground zero on lead, where we hope to continue the assessment of what happened, to follow these children for decades, but most importantly, to intervene. Um, to intervene for these children, which has never been done before, and to become um, a model to create benchmarks uh, so that the rest of the nation can learn about what happened in Flint and how we were able to change the story and change the tra trajectory um, for our children. 
These evidence-based interventions span many domains, most importantly education, nutrition, and health. Because there is no medical treatment for lead, the treatment for lead is mitigating the impact of lead. Early literacy programs, universal preschool, school health services, quality education systems are key for our children. Nutrition plays a tremendous role not only prevent for preventing ongoing exposure, but preventing long-term re-exposure. Uh, lead eventually gets stored in your bones, and it can last there for decades. When you are stressed or pregnant or have poor nutrition in your future, it comes back out of your bones and can cause that neurotoxicity all over again. So that is why nutrition plays a critical role in mitigating this exposure. In terms of health care, we are grateful for the Medicaid expansion, but that only covers our children. Um, the adults were also exposed to lead and many other things in this water, including Legionnaire's disease and many skin manifestations. So current efforts at both the state and federal level efforts, are, our efforts on the academic front are not enough. We need congressional action to address the necessary short and long-term response. I firmly believe that it is the imperative of public policymakers at all levels of government, regardless of party or affiliation, to act quickly to address the urgent needs of the Flint community. We need congressional lawmakers to respond to this man-made disaster with the same impetus and robust response as they do for any other kind of disaster. Our nation has never been reluctant to aid victims of hurricanes and floods and tornadoes. Short-sighted cost-cutting and willful bureaucratic blindness caused the calamity in Flint, but it is nothing short of a natural disaster. In addition, the magnitude of this disaster is much worse in the long run. We are not a remote city in a developing world with a contaminated water supply. We are a great American city situated in the middle of the Great Lakes, the largest source of fresh water in the world, yet we are going on our third year with a contaminated water supply. Hopefully you agree that Flint families need our help, and it is, I ho it is my hope that our discussion today uh, and with your committee's interest, we will cut through the gridlock and spur significant action by Congress um, to, to create some legislation. Thank you for, your oppor for the opportunity to address the committee today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for your testimony. Ms. Alker, you're recognized for five minutes for your summary. Thank you very much, Chairman Pitts, Ranking Member Green, and members of the committee. Um, glad to be here today, though the topic is indeed a sobering one. Uh, I'm not here today to talk about why the Flint crisis happened, but rather to respond to the committee's charge of examining lessons learned. This is an especially important exercise for children around the country, not just in Flint, because they may too be at risk of high levels of lead exposure, or some of them reside in places that are known to have high lead. Uh, high levels of lead exposure. So we must examine the Flint crisis not only for the children of Flint, but for children nationwide, especially low-income children who are at greater risk of lead exposure. Of course, prevention is the key to ensure that such tragedies do not happen again. But sadly, prevention is too late for the children of Flint and other children who have already been identified with elevated blood, blood, blood lead levels. Policymakers must act immediately to ameliorate the harm that has been done. One essential part of this response is to ensure that these children have health coverage going forward so that they may access the treatment they need now and in the future. And while there is so much bad news here, I would like to focus the committee's attention on some good news that emerged from this debacle. Governor Snyder, a Republican, and President Obama's administration were able to come to agreement on a Section 1115 Medicaid waiver very quickly at a time of sharp partisan discord, especially on health policy. The waiver relies on the Medicaid program to form the backbone of the state's response to the health crisis for families in Flint. The terms and conditions of this waiver include an expansion of Medicaid and CHIP for children and pregnant women with incomes up to 400% of the federal poverty level who were served by the Flint water system until they are age 21. This is not the first time that Medicaid has played a vital role in our nation's response to an emergency. After the terrorist attacks of 9-11, the state of New York also obtained a Section 1115 waiver to extend Medicaid coverage to additional groups and simplify the application process. Following Hurricane Katrina, 15 states, D.C., and Puerto Rico were granted Section 1115 waivers to provide temporary health coverage to those displaced by Katrina. Medicaid's financing structure and the flexibility afforded by the waiver process 
allow for this kind of nimble and comprehensive response in times of crisis. Because Medicaid funding is not capped, it is able to respond to unanticipated emergencies, whatever their cause. For children in situations such as that which has emerged in Flint, Medicaid's comprehensive pediatric benefit, and this is a real tongue twister, the early periodic screening, diagnosis, and treatment, or EPSDT benefit, is essential. The Medicaid statute requires coverage of laboratory tests, including lead blood level assessments. And once a problem is identified through a screen, the EPSDT benefit requires that treatment must be provided. Children may not be charged premiums or co-pays in the Medicaid program, which can be a barrier to needed care. These features of Medicaid made it the obvious choice for Governor Snyder to turn to in responding to the crisis in Flint and responding to the health needs of those families. But the crisis in Flint creates an opportunity and indeed a responsibility to re-examine Medicaid policy with respect to lead more broadly. And I would like to offer two suggestions for the committee to consider. Congress should consider ways to improve lead screening rates in Medicaid. Despite the requirement to screen for lead in the Medicaid program, screening rates are not where they should be. We don't have great data on this, but it looks like for uh, one to two year olds across the US, the screening rate is only about 40%. States must ultimately be held accountable for low screening rates, but it's also worth noting that most children in Medicaid in Michigan and elsewhere, as been, has been discussed, are receiving services through managed care. So ensuring that managed care plans are held accountable for improving screening rates would go a long way towards ensuring that public health objectives are being met. Secondly, I would encourage you to review CMS policy, which allows states to request exemptions from the universal screening requirements for lead. As a result of recommendations made by the Centers for Disease Control, in 2012, CMS established a process by which states can request permission to target lead screenings rather than screen all children in Medicaid. Recent events in Flint suggest to me that this option should be carefully reviewed and perhaps reconsidered. At a minimum, there needs to be a more robust public process for states requesting exemptions from universal screening requirements. Thanks for inviting me to testify today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mr. Is it Estes Marjazi? <laughs> You're recognized for five minutes. The Boston area. I'm here today on behalf of the American Water Works Association. What I'd like to do today is to discuss how what we already knew about the issues of lead and drinking water was underlined and emphasized by the events in Flint and some of what we think needs to be done going forward. I'll do that in part by focusing on the recent recommendations of the National Drinking Water Advisory Council, NIDWAC, um, and I would say that the AWWA Water Utility Council and its board of directors have both voted to support those recommendations. I'll concentrate on three principal elements of shared responsibility. First, the important role of corrosion control in reducing the natural tendency of water to dissolve lead and other metals. Second, that we as a nation must do more to reduce the amount of lead containing materials that are in contact with the water we drink, especially the lead service lines connecting our older buildings with the water mains in the street. And third, how water supply and public health professionals can effectively communicate about the risks of water, of lead, and work with our customers to reduce and eliminate those risks. Flint should have, but did not do corrosion control treatment when they switched sources. It was required by the LCR, it's sound water treatment practice, and it's not clear exactly why they didn't do it. What is clear is that treatment can dramatically reduce the corrosivity of water. In the Boston area, when we began modern co corrosion control treatment in 1996, after careful planning, pilot testing, consultation with national experts, we went from having some of the highest levels in the nation being able to show our customers a 90% reduction. That same success story was repeated across the country, prompting the NIDWAC to recommend that the requirements and guidance for corrosion control treatment be retained as the rules revise and strengthened. The NIDWAC explicitly recommended retaining the current rule requirements to reassess corrosion control if changes to source water and treatment are planned. Even before the publicity surrounding Flint, the group underlined this existing provision as key to protecting public health. 
The NIDVAC called for additional monitoring and the effective use of that data to ensure that treatment was being operated in a consistent manner and that water systems be required to review EPA guidance and update treatment as the science of corrosion control advances. While the root of the problem in Flint was that corrosion control was ignored, it was the fact that perhaps half of the homes still had lead services that caused the lead exposures to rise so significantly. Estimates are that there are about six million lead service lines in the U.S. Installed a long time ago, they've been gradually replaced, but the existing rule has not been effective at mandating substantial reduction. These factors called ZNIDWAC to recommend that over the long term, all lead services should be replaced from the main all the way to the house. The NIDWAC recognized that a national program of lead service line replacement would need to be implemented locally, that each water system might have a different approach to dealing with the complex issues of identifying lead services, communicating with the property owner about the need to replace their portion, and dealing with issues of cost, access, and legal authority. The recommendation called for ongoing and regular outreach and efforts continue until every last service line is replaced. My system just announced a $100 million zero interest loan program to our member communities to remove funding as an impediment to progress. Boston just enhanced their incentive program, doubling their subsidy to $2,000 and the no interest repayment period to 48 months. The NIDWAC also called for improved access to information about the location and ownership of lead services. A good example is the Boston website. Type in an address and up pops a map showing lead services. AWWA believes in a future with no lead services. In the meantime, we need to do better informing the public. That was a significant <coughs> failing in Flint, a lack of transparency and a failure to take their customers' complaints seriously. The NIDWAC recommended targeted outreach to consumers with lead services and other vulnerable populations be a regular part of communication efforts and that the lead data be accessible. They also called on EPA to establish a national clearinghouse and website to provide up-to-date risk information, communication templates for use by water systems, model brochures, videos targeting different topics and audiences. AWWA is already providing additional materials for use by its members in their outreach. At the MWRA, we believe in transparency. All of our samples collected under the LCR since 1992 are up on our website. We believe that public data provides public confidence. In summary, Making further progress on lead is a shared responsibility. Water systems have made substantial investments in successful corrosion control, and the enhancements recommended by the NIDWAC should help many water systems do even better. As a community of professionals, water systems are committed to effective programs to alert our customers if they have lead services, to communicate the risk, and to work with them to replace them. Our state and federal regulators must, must exercise responsible oversight and provide useful technical assistance, especially to smaller systems. We and our partners in the public health community can implement more effective outreach so our customers are informed and empowered to make sound decisions about their drinking water. Thank you for the opportunity to appear today. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Uh, Ms. Swallow, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is June Swallow, and I'm the administrator of the Rhode Island Department of Health Drinking Water Program and also president of the Association of State Drinking Water Administrators. ASDWA represents the women and men in the 50 states, territories, D.C., and the Navajo Nation who are responsible for administering the pro requirements of the Safe Drinking Water Act. I also served on the National Drinking Water Advisory Council Working Group that recommended long-term changes to the federal lead and copper rule. Those recommendations were forwarded to EPA in December of 2015. Today I'll primarily focus on the lessons learned and the path forward. Flint was something of a perfect storm, and we don't believe that there are exactly comparable situations in other parts of the country. But it did expose vulnerabilities in our collective approach to providing safe drinking water, and, th and these we very much want to shore up. We will learn the lessons of Flint and apply them across the country so that we, we restore people's trust and most importantly, help ensure safe drinking water for everyone. Deputy Assistant Beauvais' letter uh, to the 50 states provides a good overall template for a collective near and medium term actions. We want to ensure that water systems are implementing and the states are overseeing the current rule optimally and as intended. Where further guidance and clarifications are needed, those gaps need to be filled as quickly as possible. We will also work with our water systems to go above and beyond what the rule requires 
such as transparently sharing information and sample results, while working on long-term changes that will further solidify some of those above and beyond steps. For the long term, we support the recommendations of the NIDWAC, NIDWAC, the most important of which is to get the lead out, removing the entire lead service line and installing lead-free lead plumbing components. To accomplish that lofty but I believe attainable goal, we need a national effort across federal, state, and local players, as well as some non-traditional partners such as the real estate community. We also support the other key NIDWAC recommendations, including establishing a household action level for lead, setting up a lead information clearinghouse, and providing greater overall transparency and timeliness in sharing sampling results with customers. We encourage EPA to move the revisions forward as quickly as possible, and we will actively assist. It's not just the lead, though. There are many other challenges. We urge the committee, as it considers this matter and possible actions, to be mindful of the fact that implementing the Safe Drinking Water Act is akin to playing three-dimensional chess. The rule requires requirements for the 90-plus regulated contaminants must be met all of the time at all of the 155,000 water systems that the states oversee, most of which are small. And we, states, EPA, and the utilities must also be mindful of a host of new and emerging threats from which we need to keep the public safe, such as perfluorinated compounds, hexavalent chromium perchlorate, and algal toxins, to name but a few. As critically important as the challenge of addressing lead in water is, we may not shift all of our time, attention, and resources, thus creating other vulnerabilities. We also need to be mindful of what we call the multi-barrier source-to-tap approach to this collective task. To best protect public health, the sources of drinking water need to first be protected through a variety of other statutes, authorities, and programs, including the authorities provided under the Clean Water Act, as well as USDA's various programs. Sources of surface and groundwater used by treatment facilities need to be adequately protected from point and non-point sources of pollution. We're most successful in our collective efforts when EPA, the states, and local governments work together in partnership, respecting and fulfilling our various roles and responsibilities. States remain firmly committed to these partnerships, and we believe they've been mutually beneficial and essential to protect public health. Finally, I'd like to mention the importance of support for both physical and human infrastructure. You're well aware of the issue of aging drinking water infrastructure, including service lines, and the costs and challenges of replacement. We appreciate the various bills that are seeking to address this need. Managers of state drinking water revolving loan fund programs stand ready to help in that task. But there is also a human infrastructure shortfall in states of which you need to be aware. State drinking water programs need far greater support than they receive now. Congressional support for the Federal Principal Appropriation for State Drinking Water Programs, the PWSS grant, has been level funded at about $2 million per state for the past decade. To address the increasing responsibilities and assure adequate oversight, at least twice that amount is needed for states. In summary, we are eager to apply the lessons learned in Flint while being vigilant about all of the other challenges associated with providing safe drinking water in collaboration with our federal and local partners and with congressional support. Thank you for the time to speak to you today. Chair, thanks, gentlelady. Ms. Wu, you're now recognized for five minutes for your summary. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, Chairman Pitts, Ranking Member Tonko, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, I'm honored to have this opportunity to testify before you today. My name is May Wu. I'm a senior attorney at the Natural Resources Defense Council, and I'm heartened to see the bipartisan concern and support for the struggles of this community. Um, it is a primary role of government to make sure that its citizens have um, access to safe and affordable drinking water, and it's failing right now. And it is going to take bipartisan and a concerted effort to resolve these problems. So I'm going to focus my testimony today on three things that we need to do. One, we need to fix Flint. Two, we need to fix the pipes. And three, we need to fix monitoring. So the first thing we need to do is we need to help the residents of Flint. The water infrastructure must be immediately repaired and replaced, and safe and reliable water must be supplied to them. And for those who've been exposed, then the types of interventions that uh, Dr. Hanna Atisha mentioned um, also need to be given to them. The second thing we need to do is we need to fix everyone's pipes. Even the best run system is going to have lead issues as long as lead pipes are in the ground. So a truck rolling by or construction could all, any of the stuff could help dislodge lead um, into the drinking water. And so we need an inventory of where all those lead service lines are 
and then we need to get them fully replaced. But it's not just about lead. The whole infrastructure needs replacing. Leaking pipes contribute to bacterial contamination. It wastes a lot of water and a lot of money and um, causes serious property damage. So I am asking on y'all to help identify the mechanisms to fund this necessary overhaul. The third thing we need to do is we need to fix monitoring. One of the craziest things about Flint was that Flint had no recorded violations of the lead and copper rule. And it's one of the dirty little secrets is that there are some utilities that know how to do sampling to avoid finding problems. Um, the lead and copper rules monitoring system is designed to target high risk homes, but some of the utilities can employ techniques um, that defeat the intent of the rule. And so for example, they can have homeowners flush the water for five to 10 minutes. Um, before it, it sits for the six hours that are required. Um, they can use the smaller necked bottles, which force the samplers to use a lower flow of water, which can also lower the amount of lead that gets captured. They can remove the aerators, which um, have lead particles, sometimes get lodged in those, and that can also help lower the amount of lead that gets collected. Um, and there are many more um, techniques that they can use. Um, it's wrong and it needs to stop. And EPA can stop these types of activities as it's revising the lead and copper rule. And I really appreciated Mr. Upton's call for EPA to get the revisions done um, before 2017. Um, but I also wanted to address the NIDWAC recommendations that have been mentioned several times. Um, as Mr. Beauvais said, uh, you know, because Flint has happened, um, I think that there are more lessons that can be learned um, after um, the report was given out. And so some of those things that should be in the revised rule are a more robust monitoring program that has mandatory and frequent sampling, not voluntary sampling, at the, of the tap water in people's homes and in schools. And there should also be a rapid and clear notification to people when the samples uh, detect a problem. So on a broader level, when it comes to drinking water, citizens have very limited ability in what they can do in the face of the catastrophic failure of the state and local government. Citizens should be given the ability to bring suits to enforce the Safe Drinking Water Act when there is a substantial and imminent endangerment like there was in Flint. Then they wouldn't have to be at the mercy of EPA waiting to see whether EPA is going to act um, and exercise emergency authority over the states. And finally, an important part of the story that I don't want us to forget in Flint, the Flint community is predominantly Amer African American and it has a high percentage of residents living at or below the poverty line or who are working but struggling to make ends meet. And communities of color all over this country often bear the burden of environmental contamination and the resulting health uh, problems. And so as you're working to identify the funding mechanisms to um, upgrade our drinking water infrastructure, I just urge you to find ways to prioritize assistance going to these communities because we don't want to create a two-tier system where the wealthy get access to clean and safe water and the less wealthy um, get second-class water. And so I have other recommendations in my testimony for how we can protect our drinking water and how doing so can help our academy, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Chair, thanks, gentlelady. <coughs> that concludes the uh, testimony uh, of, of panel two. We'll now go to questioning. I'll recognize myself five minutes for that purpose, and I'll begin with you, Dr. Mona. The administration announced $3.6 million in Head Start, early Head Start funding for the city of Flint. Can you elaborate on the impact this intervention will have on the children exposed to lead in their families? Yes, great question. So education is one of the solutions here, and what we do in the zero to five age range is the most important thing, and that is where Early Head Start and Head Start plays a role. The $3.6 million expands uh, three more classrooms and gives one more year of funding. So it is a temporary thing for a limited number of children. The children most at risk from this exposure are the infants and the babies, and we need funding for at least five to 10 years to address those exposed children. So we are grateful for that one year of funding, but it's not enough. Thank you, Ms. Alker. Uh, thank you for coming to the committee again um, to share your insights on Medicaid waivers. As you noted in your testimony, CMS moved quickly to uh, approve a uh, waived expanding Medicaid coverage to children to pregnant women. 
your testimony explained how children can benefit from early periodic screening and diagnosis and treatment, but you didn't mention how the Flint waiver expands coverage to pregnant women um, and, and newborn. Can you talk a little bit about some of the services, benefits available to uh, pregnant women and newborns under the waiver? Uh, well, newborns should also be um, subject to the EPSDT benefit that I mentioned that does provide for comprehensive screening and treatment. Um, with respect to the pregnant women, I would mention that, um, and I'm certainly not uh, an expert, um, but there were a few ways in which the waiver could have been improved in my judgment. And there were comments submitted by the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists with respect to the pregnant women piece where they thought the coverage needed to be a little bit more comprehensive. And um, I don't think those comments were adopted in the final waiver. So that would be something that the committee might want to look into. Thank you. Uh, Director um, Estes Marjazi, uh, uh, what lessons have you learned from the experience in Flint? You know, it's clear that shared responsibility from the operators of the plant to the folks who deal with financing, to our regulators, to paying attention to citizens is necessary to avoid this type of crisis. One lesson that I see in this is that we have rules. We need to make sure that the rules are paid attention to. We can't create rules that fix every problem. We need to pay attention as citizens and as operators of systems pay attention to what's going on. My system, we try and train our operators, train our customer service folks that when complaints come in, that we take them seriously. If that happened in Flint when the water changed colors and was not palatable, folks really investigated what was going on. Even though bad decisions had been made about corrosion control, they might have stopped it earlier. Likewise, if that information had gotten up to the regulators and it was taken seriously. So it's a case where we all need to be vigilant um, to avoid a crisis. Uh, do you have any uh, comments on what panel one said about the uh, lead and copper rule? Not specifically, I think I would emphasize a couple of things. One, that so long as lead lines are out there, there is a risk that some change in treatment, it may be that uh, we have a new contaminant that we're worried about and we change our treatment to account for that. And if those lead lines are out there, there's a chance that that lead could become mobile and uh, end up in drinking water. Or if there's a change in the source, change in climate, change in uh, weather, uh, different circumstances that changes the quality of the source water without changing you know, the location of the source, those lead lines could become a problem. So as an operator of a system and as a member of the AWWA, I kind of look to a long-term view that there aren't any lead service lines out there. Um, maybe, maybe not in five years or 10 years, but getting to that point of not having lead in contact with the water is a major step forward. Thank you. Administrator uh, Swallow, yesterday EPA announced it had reached an agreement with state health officials on environmental exposures and public health. Um, can you give us some personal examples of whether this will enhance coordination or create overlapping federal responses? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that agreement. Okay. Do you, my time, oh, all right, thank you. My time's expired. Chair recognizes uh, gentleman, Mr. Tonko, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, welcome to our panelists. And first, let me offer a thank you to Dr. Hannah Tisha for all your work on behalf of the, uh, the children of Flint. Uh, it's so greatly appreciated. And I'm also glad we were joined by a number of members of the National Drinking Water Advisory Council. And Ms. Wu, thank you for mentioning other contaminants. Um, in my home state of New York, a number of communities are dealing with toxic substances in their water systems. This is about more than just lead, and you've made that very clear. But without strong federal support, we cannot incentivize greater response on many contaminants mm -hmm. to uh, protect public health. Uh, Ms. Wu, would you agree with my assessment that the federal share of investment has not been adequate to truly carry out our goal of reducing public health risks? from unsafe drinking water? 
Um, yes, I would agree that um, you know more funding needs to go to the state revolving fund programs for drinking water, um, and it has been woefully underfunded. Mm -hmm. And what role uh, would you cite uh, that aging and deteriorating infrastructure um, plays in in that whole in that whole outcome? Um, it's it's a big part of the problem. So as I mentioned, you know, you have leaking pipes, and and if if you have pipes that are leaking that happen to be in the same um, part of the say ditch as like sewer lines, um, you could get bacterial contamination leaking into drinking water, and that can lead to waterborne disease outbreaks. Um, that's a big part of the problem. Um, and then there are other issues with um, you know contamination that can get in through you know broken water towers and things like that. Mm -hmm. It's a big part. And I'm told that there are billions of gallons of water lost through leaking pipes uh, on any given day. So uh, it's tax dollars flowing out of those pipes also. Administrator Swallow, you point out in your testimony the importance of maintaining the human infrastructure of our drinking water programs. We need to attract and maintain quality people, qualified people, to uh, operate these systems. We need to ensure that system operators have access to ongoing training and certification programs to tackle new problems that arise. Uh, you mentioned the Public Water System Supervision Grant Program. Would you please expand a bit on the importance of that funding? Yes, the Public Water System Supervision Grant is the primary grant from, uh, from Congress to the states to implement the Safe Drinking Water Act. That's our base funding to operate the program. Uh, it's been level funded for the past 10 years, and uh, you know that uh, has been while we've had an, a, uh, a reauthorization of the Safe Drinking Water Act. There are quite a lot of uh, more requirements that we are implementing among the water systems, um, and uh, you know the state programs are essentially uh, pretty much stretched to the breaking point. Our uh, resource needs estimate is that uh, the state programs are 41. This is a 2014 estimate that the drinking water programs of the states have a 41 percent shortfall in funding amounting to roughly $308 million. Wow. And are there other th uh, items, other things we can do to uh, support the drinking water workforce that we require? Uh, yes. Uh, certainly technology improvements help, uh, improvement of the database. You know, the states are in the process of um, and EPA and doing a major uh, uh, improvement in our data system, which will be transparent to uh, the public and EPA and, and of course, the state programs. Uh, so I think that will help. Um, and another thing that is uh, much needed is greater funding of the uh, state revolving loan fund programs so that we can better meet, better address the needs both for lead service line replacement and all of the other infrastructure improvements that are necessary. Mm -hmm. I would think not focusing on our water infrastructure has also like, not provided the attention to the career paths that are associated with that work. So I think by investing, we'll just draw more attention to that career opportunity. Uh, Administrator, you mentioned the value of using a multi-barrier approach for drinking water. Mm -hmm. It is certainly less costly for water utilities if we prevent contaminants from entering their water sources. Should we be strengthening source water protection programs? Yes, we should be strengthening source water protection programs, uh, particularly of the non-point source pollution variety. Uh, and many states are challenged, uh, especially by a, a nitrate and phosphorus uh, contamination issues that are leading to nitrate contamination, but also uh, cyanotoxins. And, and how are states and water utilities addressing this in environmental infrastructure issue? Uh, again, I'm states also have the Clean Water Revolving Loan Fund, which is used to help address this environmental issue. Okay. And, of course, all the other authorities that are environmental uh, program partners. Okay. I um, am, have exhausted my time, but I have, uh, Mr. Chair, other questions that I'll enter into the record so as to get responses to those. And with that, I uh, thank our panelists. Chair, thank you, I yield back. We'll send you those uh, questions in writing if you'd please respond. Chair, now I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, five minutes for questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here and, and waiting through the first panel uh, to get to testify. I do appreciate that. Um, and uh, do appreciate the testimony that you've given here this morning. Um, I mentioned in the previous panel that uh, there was an article in the 
uh, Roanoke times, uh, be Roanoke, Virginia, uh, my area, uh, at least beginning of my area. Um, and in that article that was talking about the Virginia Tech water study team, uh, it said that um, Edward said he and others involved in Flint uh, in the Flint study are gauging interest in doing a similar project in Philadelphia. There's some initial similarities between Philadelphia and Flint, Edward said. What do you know about it? Who, who wants to tackle it? Does anybody know anything about a Philadelphia situation where the initial similarities uh, are there? But it's, it, do you know about other situations? I mean, what can we do to be aware of, of these types of things? And they, they went on to mention some other things dealing with uh, some private wells and that kind of thing, and obviously that's always going to go on. But do we know of any other major I, munis I municipal areas that are in stress? I can quickly comment and then I'll take yes, pass it on to the water experts. But my understanding is that in Philadelphia, like in Michigan, um, they're gaming the sampling. So they are doing maybe pre-flushing or removing aerators or using small bottles. It is very easy to manipulate the sampling to detect low levels of lead. Um, but I'll have the others comment as well. Now, if I, uh, well, I, I, and I'll accept that. So that gives you some of what may be happening and might be fine, might not be. Now, for those of people who might be concerned, wherever they might be in the United States, watching this uh, most likely sometime, you know, in the wee hours of the morning, is there a kit that you can just go out and buy and test your own water and follow the instructions? Is that available to the general public? No, no. No. There, you, we would not recommend you go to Home Depot and pick up a water test kit there. It will not be very helpful. Uh, but many utilities do main – every state has a list of certified labs, and many utilities maintain that information for their own rate payers to get access to. Some systems provide discounted or free water testing, uh, all local decisions. But in any state anywhere, if you were to contact the State Drinking Water Act pr program, you could get a list of labs, and for something on the order of 20 to 30 or $35, <coughs> get a sample taken of water in your own home using whatever sample technique – help to understand your own particular problem. Okay, so that it's information's available. It's it's available and you can get a, a list of the labs that might come to your house. Will they come to your house or you take the water sample uh, yourself and send it? Typically they'll mail a, a sample kit to you and then you would return it to them by mail. All right. Ms. Will you go ahead. Oh well I was gonna mention that I believe there's also a group called um, Healthy Babies Brighter Futures that are doing um, that have an online test kit that you can purchase at whatever price you can afford they if are your system isn't um, doesn't have that available. They are uh, they are listed here as well, and apparently the Virginia Tech Water Project folks are working on a number of the kits that that they Healthy Babies uh, Bright Futures has put out. That's a nonprofit group, but then you still have to get somebody to analyze it. <coughs> Ms. Wu, you indicated that as we go forward, we need to do more testing, make it mandatory testing, do it at the schools and the homes. Now, would that be done by uh, an agency, or would that be done by a third party? In your, in, what do you think would work better? Um, well, I mean, the idea that I had was it would be part of the revisions of the lead and copper rule where, um, you know, right now the, the utility is supposed to send people out to do the sampling in the homes. And, and the idea would be to keep that. And I mentioned it only because in the recommendations from the NIDWAC that were mentioned, um, it was talked more about um, more of a customer-initiated voluntary program. And so I wanted to make sure that we kept it as a mandatory program for testing. Okay. And I do appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Hannah, help me. Dr. Mona Stein. Dr. Mona Stein. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. I did mention uh, earlier that uh, that uh, Dr. Edwards is out uh, a lot of money that, that they expended to bring the team out from Virginia Tech to mm -hmm. do the research in, in Flint. The folks from Michigan indicated you'd been very helpful as well. Are you out uh, substantial uh, funds as well? or? I, I, you know, this work doesn't involve money. It's It's something that is so important that you do and you don't sleep. Um, it's not a nine to five issue. It doesn't, it doesn't there's no cost. Uh, it's, you know, Dr. Edwards is a hero. You asked that earlier. Mm -hmm. He, when he heard that Michigan wasn't listening to its residents and every day that went by children were being poisoned with lead, he packed his minivan with grad students and supplies and he came up to bring science uh, to test the water. Um, so, you know, we've all had opportunity costs because of this work, but this is incredible work and it's right. been incredibly rewarding. And even though they're out of funds, it is interesting that you say that because in the article that I didn't mention earlier, he says, uh, this was priceless. We'll go to our graves knowing we stood up for Flint kids when no one else could or would. Absolutely. And with that, my time is up. I yield back. But thank you all very much. Chair, thank you, gentlemen. Now I recognize the uh, ranking member, Mr. Green. Five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, as I said during the first panel, the Safe Drinking Water Act is intended to ensure safe and reliable drinking water for customers of public drinking water systems across the United States. Clearly, it failed the citizens of Flint. Listening to this panel, it seems like it's failing citizens nationwide. Everyone has a role to play in improving the situation. Uh, cities, counties, uh, states, the EPA, and Congress. One of the most important things we can do is quickly adopt important revisions to the lead and copper rule. And those of you who are here have heard the EPA statement that maybe the summer, uh, maybe next year, uh, which is not acceptable when you have something like Flint. And really, in my, there are a lot of Flints around the country that just haven't been discovered. And that's what I think we need to be planning for. Ms. Wu, you're a member of the National Drinking Water Advisory Committee, which is playing an important role in LCR revisions. Before the Flint crisis, was there any clear uh, revisions to the LCR that were needed? Um, no, not during while everything was happening, but just to note that I'm not actually on the council anymore. Um, okay. My term ended in December of 20. 14. Okay. Anybody else have, uh, were there any, um, uh, you know, obviously they've been working on it for a few months. Or um, sure, far. there were uh, many important um, pieces in the, in the NIDWAC recommendations. Primarily get the lead out, you know, remove the lead service lines from the street to the house, uh, but also the household lead action level, which is a, you know, a health guide for the individuals in their homes when they get their lead results and um, the greater transparency so that the public can see the data and also can know if they have a lead service line to the, to the best of the knowledge of the water system. Um, and uh, I guess that's enough for now. And Steve okay. can follow up with more. So, so I, was on, I, I was on the working group that worked on that and I would say a number of things in addition to what June said. One, the group clearly felt that there were opportunities beyond the regulatory structure to improve the situation. I'll give you a couple of examples. Huge frustration among the group as we discussed the fact that current HUD programs, housing and urban development programs, were set up under the healthy homes to go in and remove lead paint. They might spend twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars in my in my neighborhood to remove all the lead paint in someone's apartment, but they can't spend a nickel on removing the lead service line. So they'll spend all that money, make the house sort of lead free but not remove the lead service line. So there are opportunities that aren't EPA regulatory programs that could make a huge difference. Other places are in better coordination of communication tools between various federal programs and even at the local level between various parts of organizations. Frequently, when we speak to folks who are doing lead education, they don't talk about water. Yeah. Folks talk about lead paint, they talk about lead dust, because those are huge and important areas, but the person they're dealing with doesn't get the piece on water. Yeah. When we were doing the beginning of our program on corrosion control, we were actually ad initially admonished not to talk about water because it would confuse people. And we said, no, that's not right. We need to talk about all the aspects uniformly, make sure that the citizens get all that information. So there's a lot we can do that's outside the regulatory fr yeah. framework. Well, and I know we have a programs, and like I said in my opening statement, that the city of Houston has been really aggressive on lead paint in, on the walls and in dealing with that. But again, uh, the galvanized pipes, that's, that was the state of the art over the last 50 years, I guess, or so. Um, and what happened in Flint, we see that there's ways that that can be eroded and get. Although my other question is, when I was first elected to Congress years ago, I was told not to drink the water in D.C. <laughs> I haven't seen those warnings in the last few years. so. Obviously, we know how to fix it, but it's very expensive because mm -hmm. you have to replace those lines, and uh, and obviously you replace the the worst ones first. And it takes a cooperation between the the city government, uh, the state, uh, and the federal government to try and do it. And that's why the revolving fund is so important to do that. But it's a again, it's not just a Flint. It's just Flint fell into it because of a decision making, and they didn't recognize that was a wrong decision until it was too late. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes, five minutes for questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the panel. We've heard a lot about the the um, physical consequences on children in terms of their physical health from the lead in the water. 
most of the discussion has been on that and then how we address it going forward. But I was hoping, um, Doctor, maybe you could speak to the uh, psychological impact because I think in the prior panel we heard that the recent testing shows maybe only 2% of the children now have elevated lead levels, but they've been going through all kinds of testing. So you have the larger context of just heightened anxiety of parents, community leaders, teachers, principals, which obviously must be producing some effect. Then within that, you've got testing regimens happening. I don't know how frequently, but it's got to be contributing to a sense among these children that something is terribly wrong and they're under siege. So maybe you could s speak to that a little bit and, and kind of what's being done about it, what the, what the potential lingering effects of that are going to be. Absolutely. So the, the psychological trauma is, is real, and I see it every day in the clinic. When a mom brings her kid in, there's a look of fear and anxiety and trauma. These are families that for two years were told everything was okay, even when in their gut they knew that the brown water was not okay. They were told it was okay. So they feel betrayed and traumatized and a huge, huge lack of trust in government. Um, and then there's the fear of the unknown. What's going to happen to my child? All they hear on the news is brain damage, irreversible neurotoxin. They think that their children may be damned for generations. Um, so we are actively trying to do reassurance and provide hope. Um, not every kid is going to have every problem. Um, but, you know, it takes a lot of rapport building and a lot of time. There's a definitely a um, the beginning of mental, hate, mental, um, mental health first aid that's ongoing, just like in any crisis, the American Red Cross and our community mental health is in there. Um, there's a crisis line that's set up um, because just that trauma and that stress can lead to chronic diseases um, and more health problems. Um, so of any health issue right now, it is the mental health that is most pressing. You talk to a family and after that first sentence, um, they're in tears or they're yelling and rightly so. Um, and there's almost a sense of um, tr a truth and reconciliation process that, need that needs to happen. They are so angry and they want to know what happened um, so that they can start healing. Um, it is going to be a long path of, for healing um, that's going to take decades. Does anyone else want to comment on that dimension of things? Okay. Thanks very much. I yield back. Mr. Uh, gentlemen, we are voting on the floor at this time. Um, Chair, now recognize Mr. Cardenas for five minutes. Questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the panel for coming together and also doing the wonderful work that you attempt to do and do every single day for everyone. So thank you so much. What happened in Flint is atrocious and gut-wrenching, but today we can't just talk about getting let out of the water. We need to address the future and do what it will take for the children to heal. I want to be clear that this scenario was the result of another effort to prioritize cuts in government spending without any regard for the protection of the public's health. In other words, this was a cost-saving measure estimated to save only $2.5 million a year. But now we are looking at mounting human and economic costs that will take decades and hundreds of millions of dollars to address. There is a saying that goes, Water is for life and sanitation is dignity. In Flint, water also stands for dignity. But where's the dignity when children's futures have been robbed? The Michigan state government's choices to cut the budget where they did should have been made elsewhere in places where the lives of children would not have been put at risk. While I know the m that most of my Republican colleagues continually seek to reduce our, or eliminate government department by department and service by service, we have an obligation to make sure that we invest in the lives of children and every American. No American child should have to suffer from a man-made disaster. This is an atrocity that should not have ever happened. This is a reminder that when we are unwilling to invest in people's safety, Flint is going to happen again. The blame does not fall on the EPA or the constituents. This dark moment should remind all elected officials that we have a responsibility to do what is right when an 
idea may not seem popular. It is critical for us to do what is right for the wellness and safety of every American so that we never have what happens in Flint, Michigan ever happen again. Unlike earthquakes, mudslides, and hurricanes, Flint was not a national disaster. The government appointed commissioner and the state of Michigan made this happen. They thought it was, an appropri it was appropriate to do something they were warned not to do. The disaster was man-made. It was not made out of ignorance. This disaster was made out of a willfulness to ignore a responsibility to an entire community. The brains of the children poisoned with lead will not fully recover. What happened in Flint happens every day in third world countries. It should never happen anywhere in the world, much less the United States of America. There were individuals responsible for the community who knew the water wasn't safe enough to drink, and yet they did nothing and said nothing. Every time we insist on cutting resources from communities, the tragedy in Flint is bound to happen over and over and over again. I want to be clear. What happened in Flint is a disaster that was man-made. And at the tip of the spear is the Michigan government, its complicity in many levels of government, so we need to do, be willing to do our job to make sure that this never happens again because with all the respect, ladies and gentlemen, at every level, the infrastructure of America is crumbling and we need to address these issues. We have a responsibility to be there for the children. Let this be a lesson that $2.5 million a year that the state of Michigan wanted to save is now a drop in the bucket of the amount we now need to invest due to this man-made disaster. Dr. Hannah uh, Atisha, in your testimony, you observed that the state and federal government have begun to make an impact in Flint through important services offered through Medicaid, Head Start, community health centers, and WIC. However, as you note, most of these are temporary, correct? Correct. Should this be something that we should continue to address for many, many years as these afflicted children and families will have these effects for many, many years Absolutely. to come? Absolutely. We have yet to see the long-term investment in our children and in our community. Thank you. In my closing seconds, I'd just like to remind us, finally, let me remind our colleagues that when you advocate for billions upon billions of dollars in cuts, we will guarantee and put in motion that we have failed to prevent the future disasters in America. And Flint will happen again and again and again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Sure. Thanks, gentlemen. <coughs> that concludes the um, questions of the members present. We will have follow-up questions. Other members will have written questions. We will send them to you. We ask that you please respond. Thank you very much. <coughs> for uh, your expertise, for sharing with us today. Uh, members are advised there are still seven minutes left on the clock for the vote on the floor. Um, I remind members that they have 10 business days to submit questions for the record. Uh, and um, so members should submit their questions by the close of business on Wednesday, April 27th. Very, very important issue. We all must have clean, safe drinking water. We will work together to accomplish this. Thank you very much for uh, all of the uh, testimony and the members' uh, interest on this. Without objection, the subcommittee hearing is adjourned. <laughs>